My name is Cheryl Fuller, and I am the Director of the Vocational Rehabilitation Division at the Texas Workforce Commission. I will serve as one of your two MCs for this morning's event. Welcome to the Texas Hireability Employer Forum and Lex Frieden Employment Awards Ceremony. I'm very excited about today's event to, in celebration of National Disability Employment Awareness Month. And we're doing something a little bit different this year. Uh, we're having both an in-person and a virtual event. So welcome to all of you who are here at Workforce Solutions Capital Area and welcome to our virtual audience. I'm so excited to see that we have a large group uh, joining us virtually. And I'd like to give a shout out to some folks from other states that have joined us. We, we say good morning to Idaho, Georgia, New Mexico. Thank you for joining us today. We're so pleased to have you. I would also like to thank our very gracious host, Workforce Solutions Capital Area, and particularly CEO Tamara Atkinson in the back of the room, her fantastic staff member, David Foster. You guys have been such a pleasure to work with and we appreciate you sharing this beautiful facility with us this morning. What an event we have for you today. This morning, you will hear from a group of outstanding employers who are leading the way in disability inclusive practices. You will hear from our resource presenters who will share valuable information on employee accommodations, employer resources, and accessible technology solutions. Today, we will also celebrate all the winners of the annual Lex Frieden Employment Awards, presented by our partners in the Texas Hireability Campaign, the Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities. We have award winners here today, and we have some that are joining us virtually. You will hear firsthand how their decision to hire and advocate for individuals with disabilities is an example we all can follow. And you are in for a special treat because today we get to hear from Tracy Minich, a NASA senior engineer, a disability advocate, and a mentor to a generation of young explorers. Tracy will share his perspective on where we've come and where we're going in our progress to be a more inclusive society. And that's not the only treat we have for you. You'll hear closing remarks from Lex Frieden himself, the distinguished educator, researcher, disability policy expert, and disability rights advocate, after whom today's Governor's Committee Awards are named. I'm sharing my MC duty today with Tammy Martin, VR Division Deputy Director and Field Chief. Tammy's job involves oversight of more than 1,500 staff across the state, so we think she's well suited to keep us on track with today's agenda. So let's get started. To kick us off and share some opening remarks, we are joined by our TWC commissioners. You'll hear first from Chairman and Commissioner representing the public, Brian Daniel, then by video message from Commissioner representing Labor, Julian Alvarez, and then from Commissioner representing Employers, Aaron Demerson. We'll also have a special video message from our Governor, Greg Abbott. I am now pleased to introduce TWC Chairman, Brian Daniel, for his welcome remarks. Well, thank you so much, Cheryl. Thank you everyone for coming and everybody who's watching uh, out in the uh, in computer land. We really appreciate your participation today. These moments that we have to recognize great things that are going on in Texas, uh, we, we don't take often enough the time uh, to talk about some things that I think are absolutely critical for the state. Our hireability program here in Texas highlights an area that we have really created a competitive advantage for this state in. And I'm just absolutely delighted to be able to take this moment to recognize a few employers that have been doing some great things. Uh, but for our opportunity to talk about all the employers in this state who have recognized an absolutely phenomenal talent pool that can really help advance their business to the next level. Our vocational rehabilitation staff under Cheryl's leadership is doing a lot of good to help employers understand exactly how exactly how Texans who may be experiencing a disability can really contribute uh, to this state's amazing economy. We keep winning awards in this state for our economic development efforts only because of the people of Texas and the employers that hire them. And that's all the people of Texas. And so when we take a moment like today to recognize a handful of people who have really, mm, I think in a lot of ways to distinguish themselves kind of above and beyond, uh, in reality, we're celebrating all the employers in this state. We're celebrating all the Texans of this state. And so with that, Cheryl, I'll turn it back over to you. Just wanted to stop by, say hello, say thank you, and, and tell you just how proud I am of these opportunities that we have 
uh, to really recognize Texas and Texans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll now hear from Commissioner Alvarez by video message. Hello, I'm Julian Alvarez, TWC Commissioner representing Labor. Welcome to the Texas Hireability Employer Forum and Lex Frieden Employment Awards Ceremony. Congratulations to all the award winners of the prestigious Lex Frieden Employment Awards as presented today by our partners with the Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities. Because of the work of the pioneers like Lex Frieden, whose unwavering commitment to pursuing equality for individuals with disabilities, we live in a world today that recognizes and appreciates the talents of people with disabilities, people who contribute their skills and talents to the world just like the rest of us. This year, it's the fifth anniversary of the Texas Hireability Campaign, which is a statewide partnership to raise awareness about benefits of hiring people with disabilities and highlight their contributions in the workplace. As you will hear from our presenters today, workplaces that are inclusive and that value everyone's contributions have proven to have increased retention, productivity, and more engaged teams. Individuals with disabilities have been problem solving their whole lives, and these talented workers are who you want in your workplace. Our vocational rehabilitation services, business relations teams can provide employers with an entry point to begin recruiting and hiring individuals with disabilities, or may also work with businesses who are already making disability inclusion a winning strategy. In partnership with the Workforce Solutions Partners, TWC is rolling out programs to address worker shortages so that every Texan of all abilities who is seeking work is prepared with the valuable skills needed as technology rapidly advances. Thank you to all our presenters today. I am excited for you to hear from them, and I hope that when you leave here today, you will have the information you need to take your next step to creating an engaged and inclusive workplace by hiring people with a disability. Enjoy the Texas Hireability Forum. Commissioner Demerson, we'd be pleased to hear your welcome remarks. Thank you. Good morning, Michelle. Thanks uh, for the introduction and the opportunity. Uh, let me just first of all thank all of you for being here today um, at, at this forum, opening doors of opportunity. It's uh, pretty exciting. I'm the commissioner that represents employers in the state of Texas. And so to those employers that have been recognized today, let me say congratulations for the work that you do day in and day out. Employers in Texas quite often make diversity and inclusion a priority in their workplaces. They do that here in Texas uh, every day. Anytime that I'm out speaking, and I have an opportunity to, to be before employers. I'm always advocating about the programs that Cheryl and her team are providing and the, uh, the work that they're doing in, in big, big ways. And so I commend you for the work that you're doing. I thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, you have a dynamic program lined up today, and uh, you're going to get a lot out, out of that. One thing as, as I close that I like to always say, we're about business here. We're not just talking the talk. I've had a chance to recognize uh, individual chamber of commerces that, that are on the disability side. And they're doing some amazing work throughout Texas. And I'm looking forward to being out there, partnering with you in big, big ways so that we can continue to show employers uh, that there are opportunities for folks that, uh, that are disabled. They have an opportunity to do some things. Larry Temple always said that individuals that are in that, this particular community are the true, true uh, dream makers. They're the ones that make things happen in a big way and you're doing it day in and day out. And Cheryl, again, thank you for the work that your team's doing. Thank you, uh, employers, uh, for the work that you're doing, uh, taking a chance and, and stepping out there and hiring uh, these employers in that state. And so enjoy the conference. I appreciate you guys allowing us the opportunity to be here this morning. And my uh, fellow commissioners, our chairman and uh, Julian Alvarez, we're there day in and day out to make sure that we're making a difference in the work that you're doing day in day uh, from that point. Thanks a lot, Cheryl, for the opportunity. Hi, this is Governor Greg Abbott. I wanna say congratulations to the winners of the 2021 Lex Frieden Employment Awards. Your efforts to hire and to retain employees with disabilities and to create an environment where they can thrive has a profound impact on your community 
as well as on the entire state of Texas. There is no better month to recognize these incredible business leaders than Disability Employment Awareness Month. Every October, we recognize and we celebrate the outstanding economic contributions of Texans with disabilities. And this October, we recommit ourselves to ensuring that people with disabilities have opportunities for employment. These efforts would not be possible without business leaders like you who celebrate the value of people with disabilities in the workforce. So I wanna personally thank you for promoting inclusion in the workplace by hiring people with disabilities. Congratulations again, and thank you for all that you do to foster a brighter future for all Texans. May God bless you in your efforts, and may God forever bless the great state of Texas. What great messages from our commissioners and from Governor Abbott. Thank you so much for getting us started uh, in a great way this morning. We are so pleased to have had you join us and we thank you. We're celebrating the award winners of the Lex Frieden Employment Awards as you just heard Governor Abbott uh, introduce and our partners from the Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities will come up and present each award. We will do this throughout our program this morning so you'll have an opportunity to hear from our award winners. And right now I'd like to invite Governor's Committee Chair Aaron Bangor and member Christy Orr to the podium to present the first award for large employer. Thank you, Cheryl, for that introduction. And um, hey, Christy, there you are. <laughs> so, um, I, uh, I have the great fortune of being chair of the Texas Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities. Um, our role is to do many things in Texas, but principally to um, uh, find ways to help promote and advance independence and self um, uh, lives of self-determination for people with disabilities in the state of Texas. Uh, one of the great pleasures we have in, as part of that overall mission is to give awards um, out to uh, deserving Texans who um, really live that um, goal throughout the year. And as Governor Abbott just mentioned, October is a great opportunity to recognize employers. So uh, we've got several uh, of the Lex Freedom Employment Awards to give out today. Um, we've got four specific to employers, um, the first of which is going to be um, the Large Employer Award. Uh, we also have uh, recognitions for the Small Employer Award, so 25 or fewer employees, Medium Employer, 26 to 500, uh, as well as nonprofit employer of any size, um, which can also include uh, government agencies. Uh, each category serves to recognize employers in Texas who have fostered a diverse and accessible workplace and who have developed innovative ways to integrate people with disabilities into the workplace, going beyond the requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act and other laws regarding workplace practices. So to announce this year's winner of the Lex Frieden Employment Award for Large Employers, this fellow committee member, Christy Orr. Thanks, Aaron. I am so excited to get to announce the winner of the Large Employer of the Year Award. And this year's winner is Lockheed Martin, the ABLE and Allies Program. Lockheed Martin has been recognized as one of the best places to work for disability inclusion for the sixth straight year. This Fort Worth-based corporation received the top score on Disability In's 2020 Disability Equality Index which recognizes employers for creating equitable and accessible opportunities for all potential employees. Their ABLE and Allies Business Resource Group continually works to increase access and opportunity for employees with disabilities, developing strong partnerships with corporate allies who are committed to advancing disability inclusion and equality across their businesses in the United States and around the world. A commitment to diversity and inclusion in the workplace helps drive innovation at Lockheed Martin by ensuring a range of perspectives are represented. And Erin and I wanted to attempt to show a little bit the award. I know it's, it's a little bit hard to see sure. from farther away. 
The, the awards are these gold medallions and the winner also will receive a lapel pin. So these are um, the recognitions for the Alex Freedom Employer Awards. And so if you will please join us in congratulating Lockheed Martin, the ABLE and Allies program. And they, I believe are joining us virtually. I'm not sure if they're going to make comments. Greg Palmer, possibly, maybe. Okay, well, we will congratulate them and just thank you very much. Congratulations to Lockheed Martin for the Lex Frieden Large Employer Award. Good morning, I'm Tammy Martin, and I have the honor and privilege of sharing the MC duties with our VR Director Cheryl Fuller, as she mentioned earlier in her comments. I am now pleased to introduce our employer resource presenters who will discuss how individuals with disabilities are an untapped source of talented workers. By using the resources available through their organizations, employers can open the door a little wider to include individuals with disabilities in their recruiting and hiring practices. With us today is Erin Bangor, Chair of Disability in Central Texas and Chair of the Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities. Also joining us this morning is Diego DeMaya, a legal advisor and educator for the Southwest ADA Center. Vocational Rehabilitation's own Michelle Sumsky, who is an expert on assistive and rehabilitative technology, and Elsa Ramos, legal counsel to TWC Employer Commissioner Aaron Demerson. A survey by Accenture revealed that companies with a disability inclusive culture and hiring practices have almost three times higher sales growth than their industry peers. Could each of you presenters talk about how your organization can help employers expand disability inclusion or start initiatives to make their workplaces more inclusive and accessible. Each presenter will have approximately seven minutes. And then if we have times at the time available at the end, we will take questions from um, both folks who are attending virtually and here in person. So Mr. Bangor. Thank you, Tammy. Um, I wear a few hats. I, maybe I should have worn literally different hats to come up here. So um, I was just speaking to you as chair of the governor's committee on people with disabilities. And, and right now I'm gonna speak with you as chair of an affiliate of Disability Inn for the Central Texas area. Um, Disability Inn is a national and an international organization um, that's committed to promoting disability inclusion with employers. This is a business-led and business-to-business -business organization that is not about um, preaching uh, disability inclusion, but it is part and parcel of who the members are, and that is businesses that are at some point along their disability inclusion journey. Um, disability in is a relatively new name, just a few years old, um, but we've been around for uh, almost 30 years. Uh, if you were familiar with the US Business Leadership Network, um, that was our, our former name, and really started as um, small groups across the country focused on disability inclusion, created the national organization. Um, so one of the neat things about Disability In is the affiliates, and there's over 25 affiliates across um, the country. Uh, and three here in Texas, we really are this um, started from grassroots. So I mentioned three affiliates here in Texas, uh, Central Texas area, North Texas, as well as the greater Houston area. And, and the focus of Disability In uh, can, is disability inclusion, um, more granular than that, focused on disability inclusion in the workforce. So our organizations identifying hiring and advancing uh, people with disabilities in their workforce, uh, disability inclusion in the supply chain. So uh, when we think about what is supplier diversity, uh, disability is part and parcel of that, both uh, 
disability owned businesses as well as veterans with disability owned businesses. And the last area is what we call marketplace. Uh, and, and that includes the products and services an organization might offer to its customers, the customer service it provides, uh, it's, it's a public face to, um, to the outside world. And that not only includes um, the websites and products and things like that. So I think one of the things that about those different areas is uh, traditionally, workforce was an HR endeavor, um, and supply chain was a supply chain endeavor, and marketplace was really product folks. And technology was often a fourth kind of wheel to that, but more and more we're realizing technology is actually infused in all of that. And when we think about uh, accessibility and inclusion, uh, we think about that across all those areas. I know at at and uh, where uh, my day job is, uh, that is the evolution that we've gone through regarding technology, that it's not just an IT department concern, it is a concern across the company. I mentioned disability in is business to business. So uh, one of the parts and why being a member of disability in is so key is that we're all as an organization uh, somewhere along our disability inclusion journey. Some organizations are farther along than others, um, but no matter where that organization is, there's a, a fundamental truth, which is um, we've all learned something, maybe the hard way, but we learned something about how to advance disability inclusion uh, in our workplace, even if it was uh, an early step uh, or we've been at it a long time. And because of that, when we get together as businesses and members of a disability and affiliate or the national disability and organization, we all have something to share, to teach each other. And collectively, that means we have a whole lot to learn and, and get better at. Um, and this is a, a journey that matters. Um, so some organizations may have come to disability inclusion from a compliance mindset. Um, the federal government, if they're a, a federal contractor, they have a 7% utilization goal to attain. How does a business even start uh, working toward that goal? Um, maybe it's because of an ADA lawsuit against your website or mobile app. So compliance is certainly a, a place to get started, and many organizations start there, but it's more than just compliance. Uh, it's also the right thing to do, um, engaging in uh, the community and serving the community of people uh, of all different backgrounds and all different situations includes people with disabilities. But really we want, and Tammy mentioned this at the beginning, we want to work toward an understanding that disability inclusion is not just the right thing to do. It's not just because uh, there's some lawyer going to tell us that we better do it or else. It's because it's good for the bottom line. Uh, organizations that have a more mature focus on disability inclusion have better bottom line results. And ultimately at the end of the day, that's the win-win. We're not doing it because uh, we, we feel guilty or, or we're afraid of punishment. We're doing it because it aligns closely, perfectly with the mission of the organization. Um, and, and that becomes not a cost of doing business, but a catalyst for innovation, a catalyst for inclusion in the workplace. Uh, how do you do that? How does an organization, where to start? Uh, in Christie's mention of uh, Lockheed Martin's work, mentioned the Disability and Quality Index. So that is a program disability and runs along with American Association of People with Disabilities. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's a competition that you get a score uh, and better you do on that score, the better you reflect the um, disability inclusion journey you're on. But we always say this, that DEI score, it's more than that score because it's a roadmap for how an organization can continually improve. And even if you get 100, a perfect score on DEI, there are still plenty of uh, opportunities to improve disability inclusion. Uh, give you just a few examples of things you can learn, uh, events that we've done um, and Central Texas here has talked about how to do inclusive apprenticeships for people with disabilities, the role of technology in the workplace, even for things like the job application 
um, or vocational testing uh, or filling out your time card, <laughs> things you need to do to actually get your paycheck. Um, and and we're busting some myths about the, the re uh, recruiting, hiring, onboarding, retention and advancement of people with disabilities. And last, I'll, I'll leave you with um, one area of, uh, I think, great opportunity. Uh, disability inclusion a lot of times focuses on uh, the top level. What can an organization do uh, big picture? Uh, but don't forget about your employees with disabilities and leverage their talent, their skills, their innovative thinking. They know the business. They know the opportunities that that business has to foster greater inclusion. So whether an organization already has a formal employee resource group or business resource group um, to help, or that might be something that the organization wants to start. So uh, whether you join us in Disability in one of our affiliates or at the national level, um, disability inclusion has the bottom line benefits. There is a business case for disability inclusion uh, and that can be made in any size organization. So. Today and all year round, we celebrate businesses that are focused on advancing disability inclusion uh, in their organization. Uh, we support it um, not only today, but all year round. So thank you. Next up, we're gonna hear from Diego de Maya, who is joining us virtually. All right, we're gonna change things up a bit and we are going to turn it over to Michelle Sumsky who is also joining us virtually. So let's see if we can get her in. All right, can you see me? Awesome. I'm Michelle Sumsky, I'm the State Office Program Specialist for Assistive- Hang on one second, Michelle. We're, we're able to hear you, but not see you on the screen. So give us just a second. Please. Okay. Let's see, I'm getting an email. Okay, we can see you now. So go ahead. Thanks, Michelle. Sure. Um, I'm the program specialist for the cool stuff, assistive technology. And I get asked a lot of times, uh, what's a common assistive technology need? And it really is about access. Um, it's, a, it's allowing that individual access to get to the workplace. Um, it, it rarely is about their skill to do the job. So if we work well on the access piece, what does that mean? Well, it could be an issue with transportation. Um, it could be that they need so that they're able to independently go to the workplace in their own vehicle um, and be able to advance in their career. It could mean um, just access into the building. Maybe the building has steps and it didn't come with a ramp. Uh, we can provide a ramp or a door opener so they can access the building. Um, it doesn't always mean a major rework. In fact, it rarely means that we have to go in, disrupt the workplace. It could be something as small as rearranging an office. Um, getting an adjustable desk, or maybe some specialized software. During this last year, we all experienced a shift in how we performed our duties. TWCVR played an important part by providing assistive technology that allowed employees with disabilities the ability to continue to work remotely. <clears throat> how did we do this? We set up home offices. Um, we got software. We got connectivity. Um, we connected, we worked with the employers on what they needed so that we could get the employees to, to continue their jobs. 
Um, it was an incredible year. Uh, everybody works very tirelessly. But the most important thing is the employer doesn't have to figure that out alone. We can come in and do an assessment. And, and in that assessment, it's, it gives you alternatives. You know, you could do this, this, or this, or we could do these five things. And so the employer is the partner in deciding what is needed. Vocational rehab is here to partner with the employer as well as the employee to have a successful and meaningful employment. Thank you, Michelle. And I believe we have Mr. DeMaya joining us now. He's online, so we'll turn it over to you, Mr. DeMaya. Good morning. This is Diego DeMaya. I am an attorney with the Southwest ADA Center. I hope you guys can hear me okay. And um, I apologize, my webcam didn't seem to want to cooperate this morning, but I sent um, you guys a picture if you wanted to put it up so people can see what I look like. Um, anyway, so I, with the Southwest ADA Center, I'm the director of ADA Technical Assistance. I'm an attorney and I specialize in healthcare, um, employment law, and education law uh, for the most part, but we answer questions at the ADA Center. Um, on the Americans with Disabilities Act, basically all aspects, including uh, architectural accessibility, employment, discrimination, um, discrimination in the private sector, um, you know, Title III of the ADA, basically uh, dealing with questions about business accessibility and accessibility of goods and services in the private sector. Um, and then, of course, we answer questions about Title II entities, you know, public, local, state um, agencies and uh, government entities. And um, I appreciate being on here and, and you guys uh, doing the event. Um, it creates a great deal of awareness. And one of the things I wanna emphasize about the Southwest ADA Center is that we provide a neutral um, a place for people to call through our 800 number, which is 800-949-4232. And, um, or they can go to our website at southwestada.org and um, they can do their own research. We have a disability law index, which is very easy to use. And then we also have a lot of publications that we update continually on the ADA on different topics. And uh, one thing that's important to note about the ADA Center is that um, we provide a confidential uh, consulting uh, program where people can call us on the phone or send us emails that we can respond to in writing. So that's always a good thing that we can respond in writing if you, if people want to call us with complex issues and they want something written that we can provide um, in terms of technical assistance and, you know, uh, guidance. And then uh, on the phone, we can provide, you know, consulting and, you know, uh, it's always confidential when individuals call us with any kinds of questions. Uh, we don't report to any federal agency or state agency or organization. And um, so it gives people a great deal of freedom to discuss their ADA related or disability related issues or business related matters um, with regards to the accessibility of their businesses. So I understand that uh, this is just a free, a brief, uh, you know, five minute uh, talk. So I just wanted to make sure that people got that part of what we do. It's very important because basically it's a free service. So you get to call someone. Um, there's uh, two attorneys on our staff that provide technical assistance on the ADA. So we're kind of like disability nerds, you know, we, or ADA nerds, you might want to say actually. We, we study everything, case law, you know, the updates, anything that goes on regarding the ADA, and we stay up to date. So I hope that this um, 
helps everyone and feel free to contact us you know we provide this this is again a free service and we're available so feel free to give us a call sometime and we can chat about the ada and and thank you once again thank you mr demaya always good to have you join us and share good information that's helpful all right, next up, I'm going to turn it over to Elsa Ramos. Good morning, all. Good morning, all. Uh, see, we do have a live audience for those of us watching. This is not canned applause. My name is Elsa Ramos. I'm an attorney with the Office of Commissioner Demerson. He's the commissioner representing employers who did some introductory remarks here earlier today. And I've been in the office of the commissioner representing employers for about 10 years now. And I am here to let you know what it's some of the resources or some of the assistance that we have for employers out there, some of the employers here, and of course, all of the employers out in Cyberland. Um, because it turns out that we're one of the best kept secrets in Texas, and we don't wanna be a best kept secret anymore. Uh, the Office of Commissioner Demerson happens to have two teams inside of it. One is a policy team that helps the commissioner with statewide initiatives, and we have that team represented here in person. The other team is a staff of four attorneys. I'm one of them. And this legal staff actually helps employers down at the ground level, down like Commissioner Demerson likes to say, the boots on the ground. We help employers one-on-one -on -one as they manage their employees, as they manage their businesses, and try to be in compliance with the laws of Texas. In my 10 years, I can tell you I've spoken to countless employers in person and on the phone. And employers really, this, I hear this all the time, they just wanna do the right thing. And if you're an employer in Texas, I'm sure you find yourself just wanting to do the right thing. And that to you usually means you know, morally, ethically, and legally, right? Not just because you don't wanna be in trouble like Mr. Bangor was saying, because you wanna do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. So how can our office help you? Our legal staff has a mission, three-part mission, which is advocacy, education, and guidance. So the advocacy part comes in helping employers in their higher level appeals that come to the Texas Workforce Commission regarding claims. That's not why I'm here to tell you about that. The other two, education and guidance. That's something that we also do. Part of the education arm, we hold conferences across the state to help educate employers as to how to be in compliance with the laws and assist them with managing employees and helping with their questions. Another part of that is that we have an employer guidebook. Prop. It's a Texas guidebook for employers. This is, we have a hard copy that employers can um, request free of charge. And we also have an online version, which is super helpful. And so if you have questions about how do I pay my employees? What kind of vacation? How many vacation days sick leave pay? Check out the Texas Guidebook for Employers. It is available. Again, you can request hard copies. We also have a quarterly newsletter with topics of interest for employers as things develop in the law. In the last year and a half, had, excuse me, last year and a half, we've had a lot of things come up and waves of laws, new laws. Um, and so we assist employers that way. We also have, like I said, advocacy, education, and guidance. We also have an employer hotline that employers can call us with questions. That number is 1-800-832-9394. And I'll repeat that. I know it's being broadcast 800-832-9394 or 512-463-2826, 512-463-2826. And you can call us and talk to one of the four staff attorneys and tell us what's going on. Please understand this is guidance, not legal advice. We can't represent you or give you legal advice, but we'd be happy to talk to you and check out what's going on and give you our opinion on what might, might be the best path moving forward. We also have an email that you can reach us via email. And that email is employer info. So that's employer spelled out, followed by I-N-F-O, like short for information, employer info, at twc.texas.gov, employer info at twc.texas.gov. So you can reach us that way. A lot of employers through the pandemic have reached us through email and I've gotten some emails back that said, thank goodness you're the first person who's actually responded back. So we read all of those and we try to provide 
the best answer or the best assistance. If we can't help you, try to get you the right department that can help you. So that's what our office does. If you are hiring someone with a disability or thinking about hiring someone with a disability, again, it's not just the right thing to do, but it's also the legal thing to do. We've had several of our resource partners here this morning talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act. That is a federal law that applies to employers with at least 15 employees, one, five, 15. And that basically says, hey, this is the legal structure in how to hire people with disabilities or retain people with disabilities. But I find that again, based on phone calls and emails, a lot of employers don't know what to do. So I just learned this morning of um, a couple of resources, of course, our own vocational rehab can partner with employers. If you have a question employer, contact them about perhaps an accommodation. And Mr. DeMaia didn't know about his organization. So now I know that that's a free service for employers that we can share too when we take calls from employers or emails from employers. Um, but there are also some federal resources out there such as the EEOC.gov, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC.gov. They have resources for employers as well as does the Job Accommodation Network. This is another federal resource that's in partnership with the Department of Labor, U.S. Department of Labor, and you can contact them at AskJan, A-S-K-J-A-N for Job Accommodation Network, askjan.org. You can reach them. I think that's my list of resources and phone numbers and things. And I want to give you just a short story of something that happened three weeks ago on one of the phone calls I received as to why it's important for employers to be armed with information. Not only because it's the right thing to do, I know it's my tagline for this morning, not only because they want to do the right thing, but because employers can get in trouble legally if they don't know what the right thing is. So three weeks ago, I take a phone call from an employer and this employer is a restaurant corporate person and this is a restaurant that's not just a mom and pop. It seems like it's a large enough restaurant. They have several branches or several locations. And the person on the phone tells me this story. They had a mother and son and the son was blind or sight impaired who came to the restaurant and had such a great experience at the restaurant that the next day, the mother stopped by thinking this would be a great place for my son to work. He was treated so well which is a great testament to how this, you know, employer was treating somebody who was blind. And so the mother comes in and requests a um, job application for her son and tells a story to the manager that was at the restaurant. The manager, believing that there's nothing that the blind son could actually do at the restaurant, refused to give her a job application and basically said, I know we're hiring because the person on the phone told me, the corporate person said, there are signs everywhere saying we're hiring. But that manager said, no, not gonna give you a job application and there's nothing that your son could do. So of course the mother was very upset. And the reason the employer was calling is because the mother was not leaving until she got a job application. So it turned into this you know, kind of drama situation. And the person at corporate was very well aware of the American Disabilities Act and was very well aware that the manager shouldn't have just refused to give a job application. And under the ADA, had you called us, we would have told you, you don't do that. You actually don't know until you get to the next step and explore what could be available, whether or not her son could be performing a job. So not only did this manager potentially, you know, reject somebody who could have performed a job and could have then become a partner with somebody in the community and could have enhanced his reputation in hiring people you know, with disabilities. So that great review that they had from the day before now has turned into a very negative experience for that family and for the restaurant. So that's bad on all counts for that employer. But not only that, but the employer could now be in legal trouble. And even if an employer, and I say this all the time, even if you as an employer can win one of these cases, you still have to defend it. So employer, you still lose. As we like to say, the only ones that make money are the attorneys in these things, right? So the employer still loses. So employers out there, somebody up high may be aware of the laws, but it's really, really important to train everybody, okay? Nobody is above training. Nobody is above not knowing these laws because it really, again, affects your bottom line, affects your reputation. It affects the lives of real people. So employers keep doing the right thing. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Ms. Ramos. That was very good information. We do have some time for questions. So um, if our presenters would be open to it, I'd like to open it up um, for any questions that anybody here attending in person um, may have. And or if there are questions that have been entered into the chat, we can certainly take some of those. Does anyone here in the audience have a question for any of the presenters? You raise your hand, I have a microphone, I can bring it to you so you don't have to come up in front of everybody. Yes. understand we have disability in uh, of Texas represented here and uh, they're part of a larger national organization. I wanted to hear about the disability in national conference. I understand that it may be coming to Texas and um, you know what we can see in a national conference, uh, what employers can learn from participating in that. Okay, good question. Mr. Bangor, would you wanna take that one for us? I can bring you the mic, or if you want to come back up to the podium, you can do that as well. Okay. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, yes, the National um, Conference for Disability in next summer will be in North Texas. So hoping to see a lot of the great employers from around Texas at that. Uh, conference, whether or not you are a member of disability or in or not. It's a, a great opportunity to learn about how to advance disability inclusion uh, in your organizations. So I mentioned several of the pillars earlier around workforce. So we see a lot of, of um, folks involved in HR. So all parts of that, whether it be recruiting. And I will say the national conference is an excellent opportunity uh, to uh, identify and recruit on site um, individuals with disabilities, uh, particularly in some hard to hire areas around technology and so forth. Uh, also, if you are a supply chain professional or the folks here uh, in the room or online um, know the supply chain uh, professionals in their organization and want to help them, uh, become more aware of identifying individuals with disabilities who own businesses that they can source from. Disability In actually does certify disability-owned business enterprises and veteran with disability-owned business enterprises that can be part of that um, supplier diversity program that an organization may have. Maybe you already have uh, disability and veteran with disabilities part of that and you're looking to expand it or maybe that is not an area of historically underutilized businesses that are part of uh, your supply chain program and want to start that. Um, as well as, as I mentioned, technology is uh, part and parcel of so many different things we do today. Um, the job application is no longer, in, in vast majority of cases, a paper form. It is an online form, and there are partners that can help you identify how to make a PDF document or a web form accessible. Uh, the accessibility training uh, and, and sessions that happen at, at Disability In are not super technical. They're more about how do you, um, as an organization, think about uh, accessible technology as part of your uh, larger inclusion efforts. And, but building on, on that, uh, if you want to dive deeper into uh, accessible technology, um, that is the Disability In Conference is the tip of the iceberg to get more involved in understanding how to do that, how to then begin to identify where your actual, um, whether it's a user experience designer or a code developer needs to go to learn more about uh, accessible websites, accessible mobile apps, mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. Thank you. Daniel, do we have any questions that have been entered into the chat that you could maybe read for us? Oh, you've answered them already. Great. Okay, well, good. Anybody else here in the audience have a question for one of our presenters? A 
Okay, the question is, can you share the ADA hotline phone number? This is Diego and the, I'm assuming they're talking about the ADA center, the Southwest ADA center, is that correct? Yes, correct. Okay, so the ADA center, uh, 800, also affectionately known as the ADA hotline is 1-800-949-4200. I'll repeat it, 1-800-949-4232. And you can always reach us by going to southwestada.org. That's all spelled out, Southwest ADA. Dot, dot org. Thank you, Mr. DeMaya. Sure. Okay. Well, I want to just thank all of our presenters. Very good information. And also thank you for your willingness to entertain a couple of questions. I would like to now invite Governor's Committee on People with Disability members, Evelyn Cano and Richard Martinez to the podium to present the award for Medium Employer followed by Richard Martinez and Corey Allen, who will present the Small Employer Award. Hello, um, my name is Evelyn Cano and this is my buddy Richard. We're both committee members, proud South Texas committee members. <laughs> um, we have the privilege and the honor today to go ahead and um, introduce the Medium Employer Award. GCPD recognizes this year Mori Japanese Grill Kumori Sushi as the 2021 Medium Employer of the Year for fostering a diverse and accessible workplace. They are the first modern Japanese restaurant with 11 locations in the Rio Grande Valley and in San Antonio. Kumori believes everybody deserves an opportunity to excel in a competitive employment environment and treats employees as if they were family with a strong commitment to see each employee succeed. And to my understanding, it started with a family member that they hired and that then led to the um, amazing endeavor that they have now with over 10% of their employees at Kumori who have a disability and are employed in a range of positions from HR to management to kitchen staff. It's also important in a side note to note that Mori Kumori also just received the ideal, the inaugural ideal award with the Disability Chamber of Commerce in the Rio Grande Valley this past week. Please help me congratulate Francisco Paz, the Kumori Mori team, and bring them up to the podium for this grand award today. Congratulations. Yes. <laughs> Also, I'd like to add that I've already texted my wife, and on my way home, we're stopping by to get some sushi. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Paz, if you'd like to say a few words, you're welcome. You came all the way from McAllen, Texas. <laughs> Come on over. Come on, please, yes. please, please. I do recommend stopping by for sushi. It is pretty good. <laughs> good. I did have to write this down, too. <laughs> We humbly accept this award on behalf of the, all the Komori family and every individual that made this dream a reality for us today. This is the work of many great people along with years of adaptability and the desire to make a difference. We definitely don't do this for recognition, although this award is an incredible achievement that we deeply feel proud of. Komori has 26 years of being a local sushi chain in the Rio Grande Valley in San Antonio. Now we can proudly say we've been welcoming individuals with different abilities for five years and counting. Why? the desire to make a difference. This dream began five years ago when my father had the urge to help my cousin out that couldn't find a job. My cousin is diagnosed with autism, and all I could say is that he's a tremendously talented and gifted individual that deserved an opportunity in the workforce. He began working at the restaurant, not too much time passed, when we quickly realized that what his presence gave us was much more than what we could ever give him as a chance to work. At that point, my dad wanted to multiply our efforts into creating a restaurant operation safe and adaptable to every individual that walked into our doors, regardless of the disability. Therefore, the beginning of this amazing ongoing dream <clears throat> was born. 
the one we get to wake up to every day. At Komori, our values are respect, hospitality, and integrity. We use every single one to plan our long-term vision for our staff, customers, and organization as a whole, integrating everyone while we create a culture of respect and exceptional hospitality. So when we talk about the future and where we wanna be with the, at this project, whether it's growing our numbers to employ different ability members or serving as a helping hand to other businesses that decide to onboard with this amazing impact, it is safe to say we're definitely just getting started. This award is as much ours as it is for the incredible people that we've met along the way. They have given time, dedication, and countless resources that have set us up for success. Truly exceptional people driven by cause, and yet again, the desire to make a difference. Vanessa Vera and Ricky Rendon from Texas Workforce Solutions, Evelyn Cano from Disability Chamber of Commerce, Fabian Martinez with the beginning efforts, and all the people that are very well deserved of this reward, you know who you are, and we can't thank you enough. This journey is rarely beginning, and sometimes we fall into the predicament that we are the ones giving them the opportunity, when in reality it is them that are giving this golden opportunity to us. And as we like to say, open your mind, and they'll make sure to open your heart. Thank you. At Kimori Kimori, our core values are respect, hospitality, and integrity. In this way, we pride ourselves on being a disability-friendly employer, supporting all people, and giving everyone a place in our Kimori family. We currently host a summer program where we welcome members to join. We recruit regularly with local VR offices to ensure that TWS VRS has direct placement opportunities. I truly believe our, our program definitely helps us understand uh, our many people that we have in our community. And I think the program definitely uh, opens up our line of communication, our leadership role in the restaurant business. And it definitely helps them learn uh, a, new, a new skill uh, that they're not used to. And I truly believe it definitely makes us all better at the end of the day. At Kimori and Mori, we do everything within our power to accommodate anyone looking for a great place to work. Providing an environment where everyone feels safe and comfortable. We have a place for you in our Kimori family. Congratulations, and thank you so much for sharing your personal story. Uh, very touching. All right, now we're going to turn it over to Mr. Richard Martinez and Corey Allen, who are going to present the Small Employer Award. Corey, would you like to start? Mm -hmm. I tried. Go, go, gadget. Longer legs. It didn't work, so... <laughs> Here's my stool. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Corey Allen and I am also a member of the Governor's Committee and very excited to be here. We are presenting the award um, for small employer. We're presenting it to uh, Service Master Commercial Cleaning by Legacy. Uh, the Governor's Committee recognizes Heidi Advisian, owner of Service Master by Legacy as the 2021 Small Employer of the Year, 25 employees or less. This El Paso cleaning and disinfecting company boasts that 25% of her staff are people with disabilities. The positions held by employees with disabilities are mainly, but not exclusively, operational support roles, the ones that the company could not succeed without. I'm so happy to see an award winner from El Paso. Whenever I'm in El Paso, I always get a pair of boots like the ones I have on, and I always stop at Chico's Tacos. <laughs> if the award winner is here, we would like to present this beautiful award. Congratulations, I'm so proud of you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to say something? Um, yes. It's pretty heavy. <laughs> um, I didn't, my speech isn't gonna be as wonderful as yours. So <laughs> I don't know what I can say to that, but um, so I just wanna thank everybody for, you know, having me here today. And 
I'm just so honored and grateful because I mean, I do it because it's like I heard someone say, it's just the right thing to do and the good thing to do from your heart. Um, and the way I started uh, kind of a little backstory on, on me is as a, a young child, I remember I have an aunt who has a disability and she was rejected several times for you know not being hired because she was supposedly different. And um, that kind of led me to the path where I am today because everyone's different. <laughs> and um, so I, I value my employees. I absolutely adore them. We could not do what we do without them. And I'm just ext extremely grateful for them. And I wish they were here today. Um, the last part of my business's legacy and the reason for the legacy is just trying to give back to the community and again, to my employees and just, just be an example to everyone. Um, I wanna thank uh, the Texas well, Workforce Solutions Vocational Rehab, Bertha Torres, who nominated us because we wouldn't be here without, without the nomination and uh, my friends and my family and just everyone. Thank you. If we can get a quick oh yeah, absolutely. Maybe we move more to the center. Okay. You know, if I ever won one of these awards, I'm gonna put it on a gold chain and wear it every day. <laughs> Congratulations, Service Master Clean by Legacy. And I would just like to say to the employers that are here and who are award recipients, you are making a difference. And thank you for that. We are now going to take a short 10 minute break. Let everybody stretch their legs, maybe grab some coffee if you are here attending with us in person. Over to your left, there is some coffee and some snacks. For those of you who are attending virtually, hopefully you have some snacks or coffee refills available to you. Restrooms are in the back of the computer room. From this room, you will take two right turns. Our staff will help point you in the right direction. While we break, we're gonna see a slideshow composed of current and past winners of the Texas Disability Employment Awareness Poster Contest. These artists represent talent, passion, and drive with their beautiful artwork. Please enjoy the presentation, and we will see you back in 10 minutes. Waiting for you to show it. Well, hello everyone. In this year's National Disability Employment Awareness Month poster winner is Katha Hatla. And this year's theme is Recovered, Re America's Recovery Empowered by Inclusion. The artwork illustrates a coral reef with brightly colored flower gardens that ecolog ecologically work together, just like employees in a workplace. Our 2020 poster winner is Diana Rodriguez, and the 2020 theme was Inspiring Access and Opportunity. The poster demonstrates a computer-generated artwork of cities, uh, cityscape in brightly colored orange, green, and blues. The 2019 poster winner was Megan Bacliopo, and I apologize if I didn't say that right. It's B-A-C-I-G-U-L-U-P-O. The theme for that year was the right talent right now. The artwork is on cardboard and made of pastels and is a computer screen as an individual person's head with a body 
seated and a waterfall of colors coming from the computer screen. The 2018 winner is Ashley Satter. The theme that year was America's Workforce Empowering All. And in this poster, we see an image of the United States with illustrations of a street that runs from one side to the other and various people with disabilities walking the avenue. In 2017, the winner was Nancy Wood and the title Arise and Shine is a computer generated art piece of artwork that shows an image of a woman sitting on a ground in clouds that are pink and blue reaching for the horizon that illustrates a brightly colored sunrise. The 2016 winner was Astrid Weakland. And the NDAM theme that year was My Destiny is One Part of Who I Am. The poster illustrates a light brown horse with a gorgeous white mane and tail flying, running through a field in a forest in the background. The, that was the 20... 17 winner. Okay, on to 2016. The 2016 winner was Astrid Weekin, and the NDA theme was that my destiny is part of who I am. Oh, I'm sorry, I already I got these backwards. The 2015 winner is Astrid. The 2016 winner is actually Denise Tidwell. And the NDA and theme was hashtag inclusion works. And the artwork is a pastel piece of a young girl signing the word butterfly with colorful flowers and butterflies in her hair. The 2014 poster winner was Grant Monnier, and the NDAM theme was Expect, Employ, Empower. The artwork is a paper collage of a night sky on the left side overlaid by the sun and a crescent moon with daylight shining to the right. The 2013 winner The 2013 winner is John Bramblett and the National Disability Employment Awareness Fund thing that year was because we are equal to the task. The artwork is a painting of a cowboy on a horse looking to their horizon as the sun is going down. There are brightly, there is a brightly colored sky with reds, oranges, and blues as the sun is setting. The 2012 poster winner was Beverly Fuqua, and the theme at that time was a strong workforce is an inclusive workforce. What can you do? This is a colored pencil piece of artwork that shows pink flamingos wading in the water with the forest in the background. The 2011 poster winner is Patricia Hebler, and the theme, Profit by Investing in Workers with Disabilities, was the 2011 theme. Her piece is a painting of a small boy trying to get on a bike that is too big for him, and it's headed downhill with a flat tire by a locked gate. The 2010 winner is also, again, Beverly Fuqua, and the theme that year was Talent Has No Boundaries. The colored pencil artwork is of a lab sitting on the floor of green carpet with a red handled paintbrush in the lab's mouth. The 2009 winner was Andrea De La Vinge. And this piece was titled, or the theme this year was expectation plus opportunity equals full inclusion. This painting illustrates a blue bonnet blooming in the crack of rust colored rocks. Our 2008 winner was actually a vocational rehabilitation employee and still is Bobby Benefield. 
This Indie EAM theme was America's people, America's talent, America's strength. This oil painting illustrates two cowboys getting ready for a rodeo competition. The cowboys are saddled on their horses and we are viewing them from behind with their ropes across their shoulders and the audience in the background. The 2007 poster winner was Cassandra Langdon and the artwork was titled First Day of Spring. This pit piece depicts the celebration of spring with the many outside scenes across Texas. The 2006 poster winner was John Bramblett again, and the theme that year was America, Americans with Disabilities Ready for the Global Workforce. This painting depicts a blue sky with a white church in the foreground and trees and grass surrounding the church. The 2005 poster winner <clears throat> was Chase George. And the theme for that year was a safari to explorability. His work depicts a charcoal drawing of a tiger's face. The 2004 poster winner was Gene Riley. And the theme that year was your hired success knows no limitations. This artwork is made of melted Crayola in ink and illustrates a brightly colored landscape. The 2003 theme is America's work. America works best when all Americans work. This poster is actually a photograph by Eric Chagall turned into a poster. It is of the Challenge Trek team with Mount Everest in the background. I apologize, I passed that poster up. You can see the 2003 poster. Uh, one moment and we'll get to the next one. The 2002 poster is New Freedom for the 21st Century. And this artist is Jennifer Ramirez. And this is a painting of a tree in the middle of the piece of art and a person behind the tree looking around its side. Uh, the individual has long black hair and the tree is bushed out across the top and the individual is standing in front of bushes behind the tree. The 2001 poster winner is a painting by Suzanne Edmonston, Worrell. And this painting is of a shoe. The theme that year was win with ability. The shoe is standing, is a black shoe, looks much like a tap shoe almost without the strings, but is standing on its toe with a deep red background. The shoe is black. And the first poster that we ever showed or ever had was in the year of 2000. And the National Disability Employment theme that month was Ability You Can Bank On. The artist was Edna Marie Moore, and this was an oil painting of the Texas Hill Country. In the foreground, you see a road going off into the distance surrounded by blue bonnet fields. In the background, you see the Texas Hill Country, a beautiful oak tree to the left, and a gorgeous Texas blue clouded sky. I'm going to go back and leave the first poster up. Leave this year's poster up, the first one. Thank you all for being here. That was really on the fly. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, as everyone as is coming back in and getting settled online, if you've grabbed your cup of coffee, we are ready to get started again. And I want to give just a couple of updates before I introduce our speaker. First of all, if you would like a copy of this year's poster, uh, you may have an opportunity to pick up a couple of copies out there of the National Disability Employment Awareness Month poster. Um, our governor's committee does this every year. These posters are beautiful artwork and I have them for several years back. So I encourage you to grab one if you're here and you'd like a copy. I would also like to let everyone know that Lockheed Martin, our large employer, a winner, a winner did uh, join the chat a little while ago. They did thank everyone for the award. They're honored to receive it. And Mr. Ulmer just wanted us all to know that. And last, I would like to give a, a shout out to Christy Cavanis. She's the manager of our employer engagement and community outreach team in the Texas Workforce Commission's Office of Employer Initiatives. Christy, we're so pleased to have you. And everyone, I introduce Christy because this office has a wealth of information and resource for employers. If you'd like to know how the various programs at the Texas Workforce Commission can assist you. So Christy, thank you so much for joining us today. And now it is time for me to introduce our special guest. Tracy Minish has spent his career working with NASA's manned flight programs and has traveled the world. Tracy is a senior engineer and mission control center operations manager at NASA's Johnson Space Center. Tracy's going to share his personal story with you today, beginning with his love for math and science and his journey as a person who is blind. He'll highlight how his employer, NASA's approach to diversity and disability inclusion has propelled innovative thinking. You know, the kind that puts people on the moon. Tracy is a passionate advocate for disability inclusion and is on a mission to bring awareness to the many benefits that it brings. I am pleased to introduce Tracy Minich, and I'll just give you a little warning. He has props, so we're in for a treat. I'd like to start off to just tell you a little bit. I've worked for NASA for now 37 years, so I am getting a little old. <laughs> um, during that time, I've trained astronauts for 15 years on shuttle payloads and on um, computer systems. Um, I've traveled the world as the ground segment control board chair, and um, I've served as a branch chief both over flight software uh, commands and telemetry for the shuttle and station, and I've served as a um, branch chief of our mission system operation. And I'm currently the um, MCC operations manager. And just as a side note, I have retinitis pigmentosa. So I'm legally blind. I've been since um, high school, really. And so one, I can see light and dark. So I can see that light over there. The other side sees about um, probably less than 5%. And when you... Um, when I look through that, about 40% of the pixels are removed. You know, I thought I'd start off telling you a little bit about what NASA is doing with your tax dollar. Um, right now, we have the International Space Station. We have, um, I think it's seven astronauts uh, flying about 250 uh, miles above the Earth, going at 17,500 miles per hour. They go around the Earth every 90 minutes, and they see 16 sunsets and 16 sunrises a day. And they're studying our planet, you know, looking at the fires that are hitting on the West Coast, 
from the floods and, and, and rain that's coming down on the um, East Coast and, and helping us to learn more how we can uh, protect our planet. They're also doing research up there. It's a, a laboratory that's about 2,000 square feet. So I like a house up there and it has different modules from our international partners. And on there, they're doing research that you can only do in microgravity. And they're actually doing some research right now um, to cure cancer that you need microgravity to do. So there's a lot of things they're doing um, up there right now. Um, on Halloween, we will launch a new crew up. They'll be flying on the SpaceX um, Crew 3 vehicle and they'll launch. And what I love about it, it we are now once again launching American astronauts from, um, on American built rockets from American soil. So I always tell the Russians, even though one of our partners, you know, move over, we're back. And, <laughs> and Boeing is actually um, gonna be launching astronauts later this year. So that I'm pretty excited about um, the things we're doing there. You probably heard, but we're doing robotics um, um, science all across the universe. Um, you probably heard mostly about the Mars rover that we have there called um, Perseverance. And then we have, uh, um, that's actually collecting um, soil samples and rocks that we're gonna bring back to earth and looking for um, ancient life. Um, we also have the rover is actually um, preparing um, samples that we'll bring back. And then we launched the um, Ingenuity helicopter. And what's so cool about this, you know, rovers, they crawl, helicopters, they fly. So they can move much faster and cover much and give us a different perspective. Um, in addition to that, one of my favorite things we're gonna launch in November is a, um, um, a rocket called DART. You know, how you throw a DART. And it's a really great name because it's called the Dual Asteroid Redirectional Test. And what this thing will do, it's called uh, Planet Defense. Um, if an asteroid is hidden towards the Earth, all you got to do, if you can get it further enough away, all you have to do is crash into it, change its trajectory just a tad. So if it was coming right at you, you move it over a little bit out here. Next thing you know, it's way off and misses Earth. So we're actually going to go and, and, and throw ourselves into an asteroid and just nudge it off its course and prove we could do this. And and we're having about 54 asteroids that are going to be coming towards the Earth in the next couple of years. If all of them are going to miss us, but we don't know when that would come. Um, next, I will talk to you about the James Webb Telescope. That launches on December the 18th. It is so awesome because it is bigger, more powerful, more complex, and much more than a Hubble. I actually trained astronauts on how to deploy the Hubble Telescope in um, 9091 timeframe. And this one is going to be so much more powerful. They say that we'll be able to look back to the beginning of time and that it'll rewrite our, our understanding of the universe and our place in it. Another thing NASA is really passionate about is diversity, inclusion, equity, and accessibility. Um, we have a program I'd like to tell you about, and I'll give you my email at the end because you may want it. But at NASA, we have something called Schedule A hiring. So if somebody has a disability, we do not have to have a job opening to potentially give them a job. So say I'm a manager and I have 10 people working for me. Of those 10 people, I can have a person who qualifies. You know, the key is they have to have the skill set I need. But if somebody with a disability has that skill set, I can hire that person. That is a great win-win. That person gets a job. I get 11 people, can't throw up 11 fingers, by the way. I'm not an alien. So, <laughs> so um, anyway, with, the, um, with, with that um, extra job, I get more work done and that person gets an opportunity. So it's called Schedule A Hiring and it's for people with disabilities. And it just helps us to um, increase our numbers. Um, my email address, in case somebody's interested, I can hook you up with them, is Tracy, T-R-A-C-Y, dot B for Benjamin, dot Minish, M-I-N-I-S-H. It's just like finish, but an M. I like our family slogan is from start to finish, you can't be diminished <laughs> at uh, nasa.gov. And then lastly, but one of the things that's really exciting for us all is the um, Artemis program. The Artemis is the 
twin sister of Apollo, which I think is so appropriate. Um, and we're going back to the moon. So in February, I think it's February 12th now, we're going back to the moon in a, in a human rated vehicle. We'll have the Orion capsule, we'll have the SLS, the um, um, shuttle, I mean, sorry, the space launch system will carry us up there, we'll orbit the moon and come back. And then in 2024, we'll, have, we'll launch the first um, female and then the first um, person of color. And that's really exciting um, to do. And this time we're going to stay. And then I always say, you know, the, all the astronauts live in Houston. They live in Texas. So I always say that those uh, female astronauts, we wear in cowgirl boots when they go to the moon. <laughs> so I'm pretty excited about that. So in my pocket, I have a hundred pennies representing your tax dollar. Let me see where my podium is here. Uh, anyway, I have a hundred pennies representing your tax dollar. So how many pennies do you think NASA gets out of these hundred pennies? So I'm gonna throw these out. No, yeah, hundred pennies is a lot more than you think. Here's a few more. I'll do a few over the back. Uh, throw in some more in here. Still going. Oh my gosh. So when I talk with kids and I go, I talk to them, this is a good thing for people that have visual impairment. I usually stick a penny, have one hidden in my ear and I'll throw out all the pennies and then I'll pull one out of my ear and say, we get a little bit less than one penny out of your tax dollar. That's what NASA gets for their budget. So we're doing all that and much more. So I always say NASA is a good investment for um, our nation and a good investment for the world. Um, I thought I would now talk to you a little bit about my thoughts of disability, um, inclusion, diversity, um, and um, equity. So Sherry, would you bring my, I think I gave you my phone. If I put it in my pocket, um, I have assisted technology initiative no telling what it will bring up. Thank you, dear. I got it. All right. Whoops. So let me, I'm gonna turn on my, oops, I have my headphone on. So I gotta cut it off. Let me bring up my email real quick. So this is kind of showing you some of the assistive technologies. There we are. So this is just give you a little So I'm bringing up a thing about Neil Armstrong real quick. All right. So I'm going to. Here we go. So I cut that off for you. Yeah. Speech on. Speech off. Oh, y'all could, could y'all not hear it? Oh, let me do it again. Oh. Speech on. Play video. Toggle button. Pre previous video. Dim. So I have to go back Play one. Video. Toggle button. Check. Play video. Toggle button. Uh, Uncheck. Oh, So you just saw a little problem solving there real quick using assisted technology. Um, the reason I played that video that as great a man as Neil Armstrong was, um, we could not have gone to the moon and returned um, humans safely if we had filled. You know, they want to get in a little ad there. So um, we, um, we could not have gone to the moon and returned someone safely if we'd filled NASA with just clones of Neil Armstrong. It took diversity of thought, different perspective, and unique problem solving skills to meet the challenge. You know, um, the cloning is overrated. Diversity and inclusion is underrated. But I like to say the times they are changing. And there was a great protest song in 1963 by Bob Dylan, and I would challenge you to go back and listen to it, but I think it applies today just as much. And I'm gonna do a quick tribute to Bob Dylan and uh, do a little quick impersonation. It will, it will be bad, but you know, he's not that good either. So, <laughs> so the times they are changing. <laughs> Thank you.
So there's my little um, song. I had to play my harmonica, a round of applause. But, but um, being serious, people with disabilities are great problem solvers, you know, and they can add to the bottom line of any company. You know, I think it's woven into our DNA. It's just part of something we do every day. And so we look at things from a different perspective, a different angle, and come at the problem from a different way. Um, with the assistive technologies that I've gotten, I've gotten them from DARS, I've gotten them from the Texas Workforce, and I've gotten them from NASA. I can read research papers. I can generate um, reviews of those. I can um, do PowerPoint presentations. I can present PowerPoint presentations, and I can even manage my email instead of it managing me. <laughs> and, and I do all this as well as a sighted person. You know, when the pandemic hit, you know, I think people with disabilities had an advantage. You know, we were quickly able to assimilate those um, Zoom and Microsoft Teams into our collective, a little um, thing for the board. But um, in, in the, and one of the things I think people, there was a research study that found that listening to somebody's voice, their tone, their volume, their cadence, was a better indication of their mental state or their emotional state. And um, people now with Zoom and Microsoft Teams, they don't turn on their cameras. So people that are blind, we have trained our ears to read those cues. So I've actually been in meetings and I've heard somebody sounding just a little bit off. And I pick up my phone or I call them on Teams and I talk to them and a lot of times they're going through something. So I really think that people who are blind have an advantage in this world where nobody turns on their phones because we've trained ourselves. Another good example of what we're doing when you don't have eyesight is that everybody now likes to sometimes not read books, but actually do audio books. And for a blind person, it's really what we do. You know, I don't use my eyes to get the information to my brain, but an audio book, I get the same information a sighted person does. I can process all that and I can take it and generate everything out of it. So it really is your eyes are just a medium that you use. And a lot of the things that are disabilities, we just go at it differently than we do. You know, I tell people that people with disabilities don't want to be known for their weaknesses, but for their strengths, not for what they can't do, but what they can do, and not for their disability, but their abilities. I thought I might give you a little bit of my journey from being a, a wee little kid many years ago into my journey to when I got to NASA. Um, I came from a family that was um, very much dysfunctional. <laughs> uh, my um, dad was an alcoholic and he was verbally and physically abusive. Um, I, I will say this, he did drill into me. If you don't go to college, you're nothing. So it gave me that drive. And, and then I will tell you too, that my dad later on quit drinking when I had my, my children and he was a wonderful grandfather. But we came from a very um, disruptive family. When I went to school, you know, I started off in grade school, I would be pulled out of my classes to go to special classes because um, I had a speech impediment and um, I could not spell at all. So I remember two flashcards are just in my head. Church, that's probably from my mom or my grandmother, <laughs> but church, big C-H, little U-R, big C-H. Or there was another one called truck. That was probably my, uh, my grandfather because he was a farmer, but it had a big T-R, little U-C, and a big K, truck. So I struggled with that. And I found out later I had dyslexia, but at the time, you know, people didn't even know about dyslexia, whatever. So my teacher um, told my mom she needed to go have my IQ tested. So um, she took my older brother and my younger brother, I mean, my older sister, my younger brother with me because she didn't want me to be suspicious. And you know what? I tested okay. <laughs> and what was so funny is my mom would always say, you know, your younger brother, he was off the scale. He is a genius. And I'd say, Mom, so how did I do? You did okay. <laughs> but your brother, he's so smart. And so I always tell my brother, I say, 
hey, you may be smarter than me, but I work at NASA. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so when I went to um, take the SAT, I scored poorly in English, but I scored really high in math and science. So I was allowed to go to University of Georgia that summer after graduating from high school on probation, but I made a big mistake. I thought I'll take English and math. And um, I was consistent in my English grades. Um, I made an F on every test. <laughs> um, if you misspelled a word or if you had an incomplete sentence, this teacher gave you an F. So really I flunked out of the University of Georgia my first semester. I went, I changed tires for a year. I worked in a chicken plant for a year. I had this thing, if I take a job, I would do it for a year no matter what. And then I was working in a cotton mill from three to 11 when I finally saved up enough money to go back to school. So when I went, I had to take remedial English and spelling. And when I passed those, they let me back in the university. And it was frustrating to pay for those courses, but I did it. And the best thing besides getting my degree, well, better, I met my wife over there and we've been married 43 years. And so she's been a good one. I tell people I married above my pay grade and I like winning. So, <laughs> so um, anyway, from there, I got back into the University of Georgia, started taking courses, and I met with my counselor, and I knew, you know, I was already legally blind, so I told her about it. She said, well, you don't need to go into math and science. You need to go into counseling. And I know there's a lot of counselors out there, and it's a great field. And my youngest son works for the Texas Workforce, which I'm very proud of but it wasn't where my strengths were or where my heart was. And she just kept trying to get me to change because there really weren't assistive technologies very much back then in that. So um, I changed counselors um, <laughs> and, and I got my degree in um, computer science from the University of Georgia. So then um, NASA comes recruiting and I get hired and I come out here and it's just like a dream. So I, I, I get out here and I say, I'm gonna find a doctor because you know, I need to keep up with my eyesight. Um, so I go um, to my doctor, he comes back in the room and he says, hey, you're legally blind. I'll have my assistant come in and help you fill out the paperwork to go on disability. You know, it's like he thought I had won an award or something. And you know, it's, uh, and I really, you know, when I think about it, it's just, um, so, so I changed doctors. <laughs> but what, what I'll tell you is, you will have people in your lives if you have a disability or if you're different from other people. It can be anything that will try to distract you or tell you, cast your eyes down, don't reach for the stars. And I just say, you've got to avoid those people or you've got to educate them. And I think it's more important to educate them and then just prove them wrong. You know what you can do. Um, so anyway, I ended up working at NASA. So I thought um, I would do a couple little things on the side before I um, go any further. I have a couple of things. Let me see what I have here. Oh, I thought I would do a little bit of a, a game show style thing for myths about disabilities. So we're going to do Family Feud here. And the first question is, people with disabilities have um, are, um, lower performance than people without um, disabilities. Survey says, wrong, people with disabilities. Score on average the same as people without disabilities. Uh, the second myth I'd like to talk about is people with disabilities have high absence T. Survey says, false. Matter of fact, people with disabilities on average have lower absence T for employees. In my 37-year career, I have eight hours of sick leave. That's all I've done. And the only reason I have that eight hours is because I was projectile vomiting. <laughs> I know, too much information. But if I was scheduled to go to work, I'm given vacation for the other, and I work around that. So I, I probably lowered our hours a little bit. Um, the third myth that is about people with disabilities is that we are very expensive. Our assistive technologies, um, accessibility, and all that is very expensive. So survey says, oops, <laughs> um, that is false too. On average, we're under $500. I actually looked up and it's around $317 
and 14 cents take a penny or two away. So really we're pretty cheap. And I have um, we're, um, Zoom text, uh, JAWS, I have magnifiers, things like that. And I've not updated mine in a couple of years. So I am a pretty cheap investment for a NASA and, and for, for the country to do. Um, I thought I would do one other thing. I always get asked by kids, um, do we have any aliens? So I'll put on my alien mask real quick. Let's see where the thing is strapped. So now you can say today you have seen an alien. <laughs> With Halloween coming up, I couldn't resist. And, and people ask me, do we think aliens have come to our um, solar system? And I say no, because they checked Yelp and there was only one star. So I have been, I, when I go talk to kids, a lot of times during Zoom, they won't laugh at my jokes because they're all muted. So I bought me, I bought me a little, I bought me a little sound machine so I can uh, create my own laughter. And I always get laughs that way. Um, so I thought I would tell you a little bit more about my career at NASA. When I first started, um, if you're familiar with red night pigmentosa, it kills your rods and cones and slowly collapses your eyesight. So I could fake it. You know, I wouldn't see, you know, Randy Newman had this song about short people. Short people, I would almost run over the top of them. Um, you know, I could, pe people walk by the hallway. Some people thought I was stuck up because I wouldn't speak. Somebody shake their hand out. I just learned always put your hand out because they might, but I didn't want to diverge my um, my disability. I wanted to be, you know, it, it's just, and so that tell you the extremes I would go to. I would present at the shuttle flight readiness review. This is a really big deal where we say from each discipline, are we ready to fly the shuttle? So on the night before I would present, I would fast starting at midnight. I would drink no water. I would eat no food because I didn't want to get up. The meetings sometimes were five plus hours and we would push through them. So I didn't want to get up out of a dark conference room that's huge, much bigger than this room and have to go through there and see people possibly see me stumble, especially several layers of management that would be their only look at me. Um, I would get there 20 minutes early. Some people get there 15 minutes early. So I would get there 20, find my seat that I had easy access to the podium. The other thing I would do is I would memorize all my charts and they were sometimes 40 plus. And you had to remember every chart, how much data was on there. And then lastly, I would wait until everybody cleared out of the room to leave. And so, you know, at some point I just started thinking to myself, why am I doing this? It was self-reflection and I found three things that I had to overcome. The first one was I'm from the old school of you just work harder. You know, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. No pain, no gain. So I thought all I had to do is work harder. But I was working harder to keep up with the same level of work I could do when I had better eyesight. And as it deteriorated, I had to work harder and harder instead of taking time away from my young kids and my wife. So I decided to diverge uh, or open up and tell them I had a disability. Stars came in and gave me readers, other things. And what I found out, I could do more work in less time. And I was more valuable to my company. So that was my first reason I didn't want to. Second was I was afraid management would take away my responsibilities or not give me new opportunities. So this turned out to really be false. Um, I'd been, been the branch chief over the flight software area in recon for, I think, five years. And it became turn to crank. So I went to my, um, my division chief, Jack Knight. I said, you know, I'd like to try something different. Do you, do you have an opening? Let me know or someplace I could move and do something different and contribute. He, you know, which is pretty risky when you can't see so good. But he came back to me about a month later and said, I have a position I think you'd be perfect for, but it requires international travel. Can you think you can do that? So I went home, I talked to my wife, over there, Sherry, we prayed about it and thought about it. I said, yes, I'll take that job. And I ended up traveling the world. I went to Moscow um, in Russia. I went to, um, to Scuba right outside Tokyo in uh, Japan. I went to Oberpfaffenhofen in Germany. 
And I like to say that name over Poffin Hoffen. <laughs> and I went to um, Toulouse, Paris, Rome, Montreal. You know, we are an international space station and all our partners have to send command to Houston. We send them to White Sands. They bounce around satellites and go to the station. Telemetry comes back. So I help them set up their interfaces to travel the world. But the really takeaway is that my manager came to me. He didn't say, gosh, Tracy would be good at this, but he can't see, he can't do this job. He came and asked me and we had a discussion together and we made that decision. And that's what really employers need to do. Look at the application and talk to the applicant and find out what their capabilities are. Don't make assumptions um, about that um, when, you do, um, when you're doing something like that. <clears throat> so, sorry, my voice is over. But, but anyway, I, I just feel very blessed. And then the third thing I was worried about is that my friends and my, um, and my colleagues would treat me differently. And, you know, that was totally false. They have treated me with kindness and respect more than I could ever ask for. And, and really, I've found that when you have a, um, um, a disability or you're different and you have an inclusive workforce, it actually boosts morale and it makes people um, enjoy work more. They're, I think they're more productive. That, so I can just tell you, I think doing that actually helped us overall. I had people that told me before, they'd say, you know, I used to think you were stuck up because you just walked right by me and never say anything in the hallway or things like that. So it took away on those. Um, to, to me, is um, there's been a um, Bible verse that I've always um, kind of been special to me. And I'll kind of paraphrase it some, but it's from uh, Chronicles 2. And it says, um, to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my side to torment me. Um, on three different occasions, I begged to have it taken away. Each time I was told my power works best in your weakness. So now I am proud to boast of my weaknesses. So for when I am weak, then I am strong. And, and I will tell you, and, and I think my wife would believe the same, I think I am a better person because of my disability. I'm more open to people that are different from me. You know, I have more friends that are diverse than most people at work. I'm a better listener. And in some ways, I feel like I'm a sports star or a rock star. And, and you know, I wanted to be both, but you have to have talent. And you, you've seen that with my harmonica player that I'm not going to be the other. But, but the reason I feel that way, I don't have the bleem and the money, but I have people that look at me and watch me and the way I perform will open doors for others. So in a way I am a role model and I wanna make sure I carry that mantle um, with pride and, and respect that because it can change people's perspectives. Um, now I have something I was gonna to talk to you about. I found it. Oh, where did I put my screen? Oh, do you have my spot? Oh, thank you. So when I do talk to kids, I'll take, um, you're probably wondering, why is an adult carrying a Mr. Potato Head? But uh, I have a Mr. Potato Head. Before we start, I'm going to take away his ears so he won't hear what I'm doing. I'm going to take away his eyes so he won't see this and his mouth so he won't scream. But when I go talk to kids, I talk to them about science. I do, a, I have 10 science experiments I do, but I try to put real world applications in them. So um, what this is, is force equals mass times acceleration. A very small object going fast can break through this solid potato. But when we work at NASA, we do something called plan, train, fly. And I know the Texas workforce is doing this. They make a plan for these students, for these adults that need assistance. And then they find out what certifications they need. They need a degree. Is it on the job training? And then they go and they take that training and then they execute it or fly. So what I'm gonna do is take this straw and this is a Whataburger straw because we're in Texas and it's just a regular straw. It's not been reinforced with titanium. Let's see if I can get this off. So here we are, here's where people are. And really we can use all this, all of us can. If we have a barrier, I take a couple of bags of potatoes sometimes to classrooms, pass them out and I tell kids, whoops, I tell them, 
Think about some barrier in your life or something you want to accomplish. You're here and you have to connect the dots. A lot of times we don't teach kids how to dream big, how to reach those things, and, and they ended up getting off course. So if you start here, you develop a plan, then the thing you got to do is execute it. And when you do, ooh, you can bust through your barriers. And I say this is how we invented the French fry, but, <laughs> but, but you can burst through these things. So try this at home with your kids or try it with one of your, your teammates before. Um, I was going to bring, let me see if I can find it. There's no other wires. Um, I'll find it up here in a second. Oh, I put it in my pocket. That makes it a little easier to find. So um, I've run 31 marathons and I've signed up for the Houston Fool. I don't know if my body will hold up for that. And when I run, I run with a tether. So I have a guide and that guide runs beside me to guide me. Sometimes I'll have him go or her go in front of me to um, protect me and behind me to encourage me. And that's really what the Texas workforce is doing. And that's what employers should do. You go beside this person. And, and sometimes society thinks, oh, they're getting a free ride. We're giving them gifts. But you know what? I have to run. Nobody pushes me. Nobody pulls me. I run with my legs. And you know what? I'm fulfilling my purpose. I am doing something. And, and I can tell you, I've told my wife this before. Sometimes I feel like I'm a dolphin because I've had people when they're going to guide me, they'll say, I couldn't sleep last night. I was so excited about this. And, and we become friends. And I go to their schools and talk to their kids um, and do things. And, and I think that's what it is with work. We build a relationship. And um, they get to do what they want to do, which is to do the right thing and give me opportunity. And then I get to fulfill my purpose. And you know what? I'm, they're not just doing the right thing. I'm contributing to their, their bottom line. I'm making a difference in what they do. So um, that's my little uh, tether moment. And I'd kind of like to just um, wrap it up with, with something. I actually had the privilege of listening to um, Let's uh, Freedom talk to NASA uh, last week. His story was so amazing. It was moving. It, it, it just inspired me. And the things he's done have paved the way for me. I am, I am standing on the shoulders of Lex Freedom. All of us are for what he's done and for all the other people. And then the other thing I'll just say to Texas workforce, your job is not easy sometimes. Um, I listen to my son sometimes. And of course, I cannot listen because of a privacy thing. But I know there are challenges that some students aren't ready to run and that you've got to get them and you've got to give them the confidence. They get uh, told like I was told on two different occasions, you know, keep your eyes down. Don't reach for the star. Y'all are a blessing. So I would just say that y'all are making a difference in this world. I, I, would, I would like to tell y'all that one day when you get to heaven, you're going to have a long line of people that you've changed their lives. You know, when you change my life, you changed my wife's life, you changed my kids, you changed my brothers and sisters, my parents, all of their lives. You help one, it's like the, the starfish thing where the kid's throwing one starfish in the ocean. And the guy says, hey, you can't do them all. You know what? I made a difference in this life. So I will just end it from um, his speech. It challenges me and all of us to give more, to serve more, to live more and to love more. And as um, Gene Krantz said, failure is not an option. And um, thank you very much. I'll take a few questions. Any questions? I did want to say one thing real quick. I think I got it over here. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Mr. Manish, thank you so much. I'm Evelyn Cano with GCPD, and I'm inspired today by um, your keynote. It was beautiful. I have a son who's 13 years old, and he has autism. He's an extrovert. He's trying to become very independent. What advice do you have for parents who have to um, muddle between that supporting role and that independence role. So he tells me things like, you don't need to check on me anymore. I'm a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I love it. I love that he's a self-advocate. I love that he's, you know, um, embarking on this new independence. 
I tell him he still needs to follow rules. <laughs> so what advice do you have for like emerging self-advocates who found this new independence, but yet we want to make sure that he's safe <laughs> and uh, everything he does? Yeah, yeah, that is, being a parent, I know all about that. And, and I, I would say, let him take small steps first that are, make sure he's safe and give him steps to build his confidence and to show him that you also believe in him. And I love it that he's self-advocacy because I think that was one of the keys that I had. For whatever reason, I was out, I didn't think anybody would give me a student loan because I was too poor. And I didn't think, so So having that, and then I would get him mentors. If, if, if he is wanting to be, say, a rocket scientist, you know, put him with a mentor. If he can do some, maybe find somebody that's, find out what his dreams are and kind of help him develop that plan or do it in the background and just kind of break it into the conversations. And, and just, I say, you know, you just let the, the, the tether out and see how he does. And when you need to, you still got it there to help him. But, but that is a challenge. But, you know, you've got to be proud of him that he's out there wanting to do that. And I don't, I don't, I think each case is unique, but you're doing, I can tell you, he's blessed to have you because you're thinking of these things and encouraging him. Mr. Minish. Oh, and I thought I'd just tell you that I'm a big go Astros. You know, we're from Georgia. Go. Oh, did, oh sorry. Oh, it's go Astros. <laughs> sure, you switched my hat. She's a Braves fan. Thank you so much. Uh, we're now going to turn it over to Mr. Ron Lucy. I'm hoping Mr. Minish left some change up here for me. Uh, my name is Ron Lucy. I'm the executive director of the Texas Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities. And like Mr. Minish, I'm a person with a vision impairment. I use a lot of assistive technology. Unlike Mr. Minish, I don't play the harmonica and I'm not a rocket scientist. But perhaps more importantly than that, I'm the guy that made the coffee for everybody in the room this morning. <laughs> so up next, I'd like to call two of our Governor's Committee members forward to present uh, a very important award, our Entrepreneurship Award. I'd like to call forward MFA Rutkin and Ellen Bauman. Please come forward. Good morning, I'm Ellen. This is my friend, Emma, and Hank. And Hank the Hing Dog. Yes. Um, it is an honor and, and a privilege to, uh, to be here this morning and to witness all of these people who have done, done so many great things, and which brings us to the Entrepreneur Award. Um, of course, that, that award recognizes an individual with disabilities who has successfully owned, operated, managed um, a business of their own. And in doing so, they serve as a mentor and an encourager and a supporter, a role model for other people with disabilities to pursue their own dreams. Um, and not only do they influence those, those other people with disabilities and their own dreams, but as you'll see in, in just a, a little bit, um, the legacy and the beautiful family members that are here with us today. The Entrepreneur Award is awarded posthumously to Gregory Stavanella. Mr. Stavanella was legally blind and successfully operated a business in the McKinney, Mickey Leland Federal Building in Houston, Texas, through the Federal Randolph Shepherd Program from 1996 until his recent passing in September 2021. The business included food service, Vending, the production and sale of United States passport photographs. Mr. Stavanova was an outstanding business mentor to other aspiring entrepreneur, entrepreneurs with disabilities wishing to achieve his same level of success. His wonderful family is here. I'm going to invite you out up here to receive your award for your entrepreneur on behalf of your wonderful father. So the whole family, please come up. They are amazing family. They're super kind. And um, I got to talk with Elizabeth and Chris. 
um, who will be speaking on behalf of their father. And I just already love you guys and like what your dad did. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I know what y'all are all thinking. If you have a, a family that's basically a whole baseball team on call, are you really that disabled? Um, yeah, he, uh, she mentioned our dad was legally blind, but he didn't like saying that because that just implies that you could be illegally blind. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, this, uh, yeah, given his, his passing uh, somewhat unexpectedly last month, uh, this does mean a whole lot, a whole lot to our family. Um, his, his work meant so much to him. He, he, um, like, like, uh, he was saying earlier about, uh, never taking a sick day or whatever. Our dad, like ever since I can remember, he, he always went to work, even like he was sick until recently with, with, with COVID going on. But, um, yeah, he, he worked so hard he waking up at 4am every day and, getting to work, uh, taking the bus to almost to his building and then walking the rest of the way blind before the sun's even up. Um, uh, I'm surprised he, he, he did that for so long without any, any accidents happening, but, um, yeah, uh, thanks. This, this really means so much. Brother forgot to mention that it was downtown Houston that he was walking <laughs> in the dark. Yeah, my dad was the actual coolest person I've ever met in my whole life. Like, it, it's, he's completely amazing. And he, yes, he never, ever, ever took a sick day. And, and um, I can remember that, uh, so he used the assistive technology a lot. And um, I listened to a message recently on my phone. He, did, he never left messages. So when he did, it was always an accident. And he'd be sitting there and I, I was listening to my message and he was like, hey, Siri, read messages. Siri, read messages. <laughs> And then I hear him tapping on the phone. And he goes, hey, Josiah, what's wrong with my phone? <laughs> he, was just, he was just so cool. And um, I remember one time, so uh, we used to have a pool in Houston. We, were, we lived in Houston for a long time. And we had a pool. And he would um, clean the pool every single day. And he would brush it. And he was, he was very, very just adamant about it. And this one time in February, he's, um, he's got the rolling trash can. And he's like walking by the pool. And it's, you know, it's February, so it's, it's cold in Houston. And um, he's walking by it and he falls in. He just, he just walks straight into the pool. And it's, <laughs> and like, I'm just looking at him think he's gonna, he's gonna be so mad. I watched this whole thing happen. And uh, he comes out, he's laughing. <laughs> he thinks it's the funniest thing ever. But um, besides, you know, aside from that, um, honestly, if he didn't have cuts all over his face, I'd think he was faking it. <laughs> Because I mean, he was he was so just no one ever knew that he was blind. He would um, he would stand at the register and people would walk up and he'd be like, is someone there? And they say, yes. And he says, oh, well, I'm blind. What do you have? And they said, well, this. And he goes, no, I'm blind. And he go, they go, hi, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> and um, no, and then they, you know, finally, he'd finally get them to tell him what he ha what they had. And then they would hand him money. And then he would sit there and he'd hold it up and he'd smile and he'd like flip it over and still blind. <laughs> but, but yeah, he was, you know, he was honestly the, just a huge inspiration. And I really wish I could be like him and I wish he was here today for sure. Thank you so much. So here is the award. We'd love to take a picture of y'all. Can someone take a picture for us? <laughs> now go ahead and come close together. Guys, let's put mom in the middle. There we go. Oh, sure. Thank you. 
All right, next up, we're going to be enjoying a panel on inclusive uh, workplaces, the benefits and best practices uh, from a very amazing panel of Texas employers. I'd like to call my two panelists that are uh, in the uh, building today, and then we have two more that are gonna be participating remotely. So uh, these Texas employers come from uh, diverse industries. We have represented here today uh, the healthcare industry, the transportation industry, retail, and also technology. Uh, these employers are leaders, not only in their industry, but in the state of Texas for inclusive hiring practices. Uh, they have uh, built uh, diverse teams within their organization to yield the benefits of inclusion. And uh, they're here today to share uh, their best practices. Uh, for them, uh, inclusive uh, employment is, is not just a strategy for filling a, uh, a job, but it's a program within their organization. Uh, they are working intentionally towards making their organizations more inclusive and more diverse. And I'm very proud today to introduce uh, all four of them. We'll start today with introducing Yanni Hurst, who's the Senior uh, Advisor uh, for Workforce Initiatives with CVS, Care, CVS Health, uh, also Caremark, I believe. Uh, next, we have Mr. Patrick, uh, and I apologize, Fulgin, uh, who's the Senior Vice President of Global Audit and um, Transformation with uh, Dell Technologies. And then online, we have if the technology works. Uh, we have Jenny Lane, uh, who's the interim director of workforce initiatives, uh, workforce development and diversity and inclusion with Ascension Seton. And then finally, we have Dominic Ellison, Dominique Ellison, the talent acquisition uh, program uh, specialist with Southwest Airlines. All right, and how are we doing on having the individuals attend virtually? Outstanding. Okay, uh, the first question, uh, and uh, when I go to each one of you, if you wanna tell uh, the audience a little bit more about your role in your organization, uh, but uh, this past year has uh, created tremendous change in our economy and in the workplace. Uh, we are all aware of the impact of COVID-19 uh, and the theme for National Disability Employment Awareness Month is uh, America's recovery powered by inclusion. And so we know that uh, COVID-19 has resulted in technology changes, how we conduct business using Teams and Zoom and required uh, different diverse skills within your organization. Also with supply chains and, and with job vacancies in the organization, uh, tell us how each of you are uh, using inclusion as a strategy to meet those challenges and, and how those challenges have affected your organization. I'll go ahead and start with uh, you. Okay, great. Thank you. And it's great to be here with everyone surrounded by so many people that are so doing so much for disability inclusion. So I, I actually just left uh, Dell Technologies in April, but I continue on with Dell as a strategic advisor uh, with them, really centered around uh, disability hiring uh, because it was something that changed my life when I was when I was at Dell. My son Ben is uh, now 18, diagnosed with autism at uh, age three. Uh, part of what brought us to Texas uh, to help um, give him the right. Uh, the right, the right accommodations, the right supports uh, in the community here in Austin. And when I came to Austin, uh, I was immediately introduced to Dell's uh, employee resource group, True Ability. So you heard a little bit from Lockheed Martin and the work that they've done with their ERG. That I, I was quickly introduced to uh, to Dell's ERG, and that really helped introduce me to a whole community of. Um, family, really, to, to help me understand what was around the community and understanding Texas Workforce Commission and so forth. And um, as the years went by, we became very interested in uh, what happens next in terms of transition, in terms of employment. Uh, and that's when uh, Dell and a lot of my colleagues uh, went to go and learn from companies like Microsoft and uh, EY and, um, and others 
to SAP, uh, another one to talk about neurodiversity hiring. So we uh, started about four years ago with our neurodiversity autism hiring program. Uh, and now we've hired over 50 individuals. We've had no, um, no one leave yet. And we're very pleased in, uh, with how the program is going. Uh, and this year was particularly challenging. In fact, uh, in, I guess in March of 2020, as COVID hit, we thought maybe we had to put a pause on our hiring program because of you know, what the implications could be uh, in terms of how we were going to recruit and how we were going to find talent, and how we were going to effectively bring them in to do a non-traditional interview process. Uh, but then after, around July, we decided, you know what, what are we waiting for? There's great candidates out there. They're looking to work. And we uh, were doing an internship, a virtual internship with our, call it typical hires. Uh, so we went forward with uh, doing the internship for about 18 individuals uh, virtually, and they were 17 of 18 successfully completed their uh, program, their internship, and were given full-time employment uh, opportunities from that. And I think that, you know, the big thing we learned is, uh, and I see this with my son when he went virtual in high school too, uh, for the most part, the accommodations were there for those individuals, you know, as they were at home or in, in their setup that allowed them to be uh, successful and work in, in ways that they uh, like to work versus coming into the office. So certainly the virtual environment helped. Definitely there were those that wanted to become part of a community and, and meet and interact. And, you know, we continued to work to find ways to, to help them be successful in that way. And then just the last thing around the sourcing and how we sourced, sourced the candidates, we actually opened it up through a, uh, our, our, our uh, media, online media, through Facebook and Twitter and uh, mostly LinkedIn is where we saw a lot of our applicants. So, so the social media uh, sourcing was big for us. And we were able to, as we talked about the Dell Neurodiversity Hiring Program, we were able to get several hundred candidates interested uh, that we could then uh, select across a, a, a wide range of employment opportunities. So that's a long-winded answer to your question, but I wanted to provide some context. It's there. great that in the tech sector, traditional competitors like Microsoft and Dell uh, our allies when it comes to neurodiversity and, and the uh, autism at work program. So uh, it's been a great community and certainly, you know, disability in and the Texas Workforce Commission and others have been very supportive of helping us uh, come together to learn from each other for sure. We yeah. first learned of that program from Jose Velasquez, yeah. one of our keynote speakers a few years ago. Good friend of mine. Yep. Great yeah. guy. So uh, Jenny Lane, tell us about Ascension Seton and, and, uh, how the challenges of the changing economy has affected work at Seton for uh, your employees with disabilities and, and how, how y'all have risen to that challenge. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, well, it's been an interesting uh, year plus for healthcare. Uh, so I could go on about that, but I'll say what, what really has stood the test of time for us has been Project Search. Uh, which Project Search is a journey we start out started out on. Um, it's been almost 15 years ago with our partners at the Texas Workforce Commission, Commission. Um, and it's an internship for young adults with intellectual disabilities. And what we try to do is we take them in their last year of school eligibility, and we bring them into our workforce. They're a part of our healthcare family in various different areas of our hospital operations. And they learn to do the jobs that are really critical to those operations. So they're in areas like uh, surgical services and materials management and dietary services, uh, our clinical lab, um, some of our administration operations. And they learn the skills that they need to really um, understand how, you know, how to compete for jobs and how to really be a part of a vital workforce. And so, as I mentioned, that was about 14 plus years ago and we've evolved over time. It's been a journey. Uh, we didn't know all the answers and certainly there's been a lot of um, revelations along the way. And, um, but I'll say this last year, it's really become true that that particular initiative we have is a reminder that we can do things and has, I think in the recovery part of our time has become a breath of fresh air with a workforce that is so exhausted. 
and also has been a solution to how are we going to get the workforce we need for tomorrow? And so I don't know if you can think about healthcare, but there's a lot of demands that are here now and there's a lot of demands that are coming. And we need everyone as a part of that work. There's no more a time where we just need one particular skill set or one particular person, we need it all. And so Project Search and working with people with disabilities uh, really sheds light on that whole spectrum of what we could utilize and how we could utilize them. Um, and as I was driving here today, I was smiling at some of, some of our longer term associates who, you know, well, I'll, I'll say this, we teach flexibility and transition is a good thing. And the last 18 plus months has shown us we actually meant it. Uh, we actually had to put that to the test when we train people with disabilities and train ourselves that you know, transition is really a, a big deal and it's a really good skill to have and so is flexibility. And I think our project search interns and our hires have shown that alongside us. And so um, I think it's gonna be interesting, but as I mentioned, I, I think no longer can we just select one type of, of skill set or person to do a job, especially in healthcare, we need it all. And that includes people with disabilities. Well, I want to thank all of your healthcare workers, all your doctors, nurses, and all the staff for what y'all have done for our community during COVID. As other businesses were shutting down, you guys were getting busier. And so thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to turn uh, to Dominique at Southwest Airlines. Uh, I was so grateful after uh, eight, nearly 18 months of, of lockdowns and, and social distancing to be able to board a plane. And the first plane we boarded was Southwest Airlines to uh, take our anniversary trip, my wife and I, our 25th anniversary to New Orleans. Of course, our scheduling could have been better because it was right before a hurricane. But uh, uh, Dominique, tell us about uh, the challenges that y'all faced at Southwest Airlines. I know the travel industry was really set back, but uh, you're flying again. And uh, you've got a very impressive uh, inclusion program at Southwest Airlines. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for, for having us here today. Um, it has definitely been a wild ride for sure. Um, and like most companies, we've had to really navigate that change from being in a physical office to remote work. Um, and specifically our customer representatives who work in those call centers and are on the phone with our customers, helping them to resolve issues or change tickets and things. They've never had the opportunity to be remote or have an option of workplace flexibility. So that was just really unknown territory for us. Um, had to adapt technology very quickly. Um, but it's also just opened the door um, of possibilities, not only for our current employees working, but also future employees to come and to be hired, and especially those with disabilities. Um, we, we just feel like it's really removed those physical accessibility barriers like transportation to and from work. Um, it's presented just more options for employees to customize their workspaces with any assistive technology that they need. Um, and then for those with sens sensory disabilities, just creating that more comfortable work environment, they can be at home in the space that um, they're used to, um, to, to go about their work day. Um, so even through the pandemic, and it's been really challenging, it has kind of forced us to, to look at remote work and embrace that. Um, I feel like it's also kind of helped level the playing field a bit when it comes um, to people with disabilities, and we find that really exciting. Um, the space that I work in is really about creating programs and finding unique pathways to bring individuals to Southwest um, and kind of like uh, Patrick had mentioned, um, we're also looking to launch a neurodiversity internship program come in the summer, um, which will also maintain that virtual component. So we're excited to, to be able to open that up to individuals across the country um, and provide that unique opportunity. Um, but it's it's definitely been a journey. It's, it's still something that we're we're working on. We recognize we've got a long way to go, but feel like we're making some some pretty good progress there. So, thank you, Dominique. Next, I'd like to turn to Yanni Hurst with CVS, um, and uh, CVS has been a tremendous tremendous partner for uh, Texas Workforce Solutions Vocational Rehabilitation, participating in the Summer Earn and Learn program every year. And uh, tell us uh, how you're experiencing change in, in the new economy with COVID and uh, with the, what we're seeing is greater demand for uh, workers across the economy. 
Yeah, so thank you for having us here. This is such an important forum. And so I appreciate the, inv the invite. Um, so COVID has been challenging as the peers um, that I have here on the panel have, have talked about. Um, I work for the Workforce Initiatives Department here at CBS. And so our, our team focuses on building workforce programs for people with disabilities and those that are um, people with disabilities, mature workers, youth, um, military. But a big part of this has been people with disabilities throughout COVID. And the programs that we built, at first we all sat around and we're like, well, how long do we think this is going to last? And what, how are we gonna pivot? And some of us thought two weeks, three weeks, something like that, here we are, you know, 20 something weeks or 20 something months later. And our programs have had to pivot quite a bit. Uh, what we used to do in person, we've had to learn how to do virtually. Classes that we provided people with disabilities to learn how to you know, learn skills for the workplace, we've had to learn how to do long distance. And so that has been challenging and it's been, um, it's been a learning experience, I think. And I think, you know, to, to, to the comments that Tracy made earlier, people with disabilities are at an advantage. They've been doing this for a very long time. They've been able to, to, to change and mold to the things that need to happen to make the work happen, right? And so uh, we've learned a lot from, from our participants. We've learned a lot from our partners on how to make things happen. So. It's been a fun ride. Thank you. So I'm gonna go in the same order with this next question. And these next questions are kind of a bit of a lightning round, but uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, uh, starting uh, with Dell, uh, tell us what uh, processes and resources you use to increase applicants with disabilities in, in your company. Yeah, I, I sort of mentioned it earlier with the social media campaign for um, getting getting the word out there about our neurodiversity hiring program. So uh, that's really been our our fuel uh, to to find talent. Um, and I think you know one of the things that we've learned as we've placed more into roles is just the importance of having some clear um, requ job requisitions out there because many folks that are interested in these roles that they don't see exactly what they can do, uh, they might steer away. So uh, we try to make it in a way that's inclusive in terms of, yeah, I, I, I could do some of that or I can I could do some of that. So um, that's that's helped us uh, to bring in more uh, talent pool for what we're hiring for. Thank you. And uh, Ascension Seton, you have more of a direct pipeline into the schools uh, for graduating seniors. Is that correct? We do. Uh, and I think it's through that that action um, that you know, less words, more action. Uh, when we have our interns who are those young adults with intellectual disabilities participating in our, our workforce and at our hospital, we have people see them and it becomes a, its own marketing campaign essentially for, oh, I could do that too. Or, oh, this is an inclusive environment. And I have um, a number of our own workforce that, you know, maybe it's a parent of somebody with a disability or their sister has a disability that will call us and say, could she work here too? Or uh, could so-and-so? And, and so I think the actions in that really, really speak louder um, for us in terms of marketing. Thank you. So uh, Dominique at Southwest, uh, what are your uh, processes and resources for recruiting a diverse uh, talent to create a more inclusive workforce at Southwest? Sure. Um, so our talent acquisition team, um, we have our own sourcing team. Um, so we use them a lot to kind of provide insights into our current pipelines, um, existing um, or potential organizations within the community that we can partner so with. So we, we leverage those community organizations a lot to help us kind of identify um, that talent and get them into our pipeline. Um, we also just put a lot of effort in just showing up as an employer and being present at different events. Um, most recently, we were able to participate in uh, Disability Inn's Next Gen Leaders matchmaking event where we were able to connect with some really great talent and get them kind of in the pipeline for some of our internships and some of our full-time opportunities. Um, but something else that's really unique, I guess, is um, we also have a dedicated accommodations team um, who's really there and able to, to remove some of those barriers throughout the application process, um, the recruiting and interview process. 
um, and just really kind of has that eye towards the disability strategy um, in support of our DNI initiatives. Thank you. Yanni, tell us about CVS. Uh, how do you find your talent? Uh, what are the resources you pull on and, and uh, what are uh, some of your successes? So a lot of the same things that some of the other panelists talked about, but in addition to, you know, just being able to leverage the resources from our CBOs partners um, that are out there, um, we send out our, our weekly open recs to those CBOs that have um, candidates and are working with candidates that are looking for employment. Um, you know, we, everything, it's not just like a cashier job that's being served up, it's everything from directors to the cashier, so, and everything in between. So anyone that's interested in meets the qualifications can apply. And I think it, it helps with the virtual environment right now um, to be able to have access to getting to the interviews, being able to, you know, um, show your best self, if you will, because everybody's on an equal platform right now. And um, the, the candidates are less likely to, um, the candidates are more likely, I'm sorry, more likely to uh, apply for jobs that they would normally not apply for or maybe not have been able to see um, because we are shouting those out from the rooftops, if you will. Um, they're on every social media. We're sending those out. We're leveraging our community-based organizations. And we're also running the programs that we normally run with our partners to be able to train individuals um, for those jobs. Okay. So this is uh, not a question for all four of you, but for any one of you that wants to take it. Uh, have traditional job fairs uh, continued to work in this new economy? And uh, if not, how do job fairs need to change to better connect you with qualified workers and help you uh, meet your goals for diversity and inclusion? If any of you all would like to take that one. I guess, I guess I, when I think about traditional job fairs, they really aren't effective yeah. for uh, where we're trying to hire for uh, whether it's neurodiversity, autism, or you know other other disability or challenges. Because the traditional job fairs bring out those that are going to be more traditional in terms of how they present themselves, how they shake your hand, look you in the eye, answer your questions, and so forth. And that's that's not going to work for some very talented individuals that need a, a better opportunity to effectively uh, showcase their skills. So, you know, I, I think uh, the answer is no from my perspective. Okay. What would you like to see change? More online or virtual engagements uh, sponsored where people can show their technical skills? Or I, you... I think it's a very much cultural. I think we need to see these if, the, if they're job fairs, I think it needs to be anyone who has challenges, feels comfortable um, attending and uh, coming forth with, here's some of the challenges I have and the talent acquisition team looking at that and saying, hey, uh, great, I understand that. This is how we're gonna evaluate uh, your skills and see if you're a good fit so that it's a very natural motion for the individual, for the talent acquisition team and so forth. But it's it's a cultural, I think, journey uh, to get to that point. Thank you. So one of the key functions of vocational rehabilitation is to help employers retain an employee with a disability who may be in danger of losing that job due to that disability. Can each of you share a success story within your organization about uh, how your organization has been able to retain and even promote employees with disabilities uh, working within your uh, employee resource groups or working with vocational rehabilitation. Well, we start with- uh, Okay, okay. <laughs> so, well, I think, I think there's a couple of myths that we that you know almost need to come come along with employing people with disabilities and employing people with disabilities long term with career mobility. And I think one myth is this has to be hard or difficult, and the other one is is that we can't that there's no career path or mobility. You know, just find someone a job and hope they stay there. And I'll you know I think that's something that's evolved for us over the years. Um, and so, you know, I can think of, of many, many times when we've had um, some of our employees that we've hired um, through Project Search, um, where we might not as a team have understood why they were maybe performing a task a certain way, 
But instead of, of labeling it right or wrong, we became curious. And, um, you know, I, I could think of small things for, you know, choosing to do, you know, different floors that were out of sequential, what I thought would have been sequential, um, you know, cleaning of floors, you know, or maybe bigger things, how to file, uh, you know, specimen fly, uh, uh, oh my gosh, specimen disc in a specific way. And maybe doing that in a, a very, but again, I, I think, um, not labeling it as right or wrong. And I think through our partnerships with Texas Workforce Commission and some of our other folks, we've been able to use that VR kind of uh, creative thinking to say, okay, what could this also be? How can we be curious about how this individual is, is performing their job? And it, are there supports that's needed or could it be accomplished with the outcome being the same thing and maybe just a different way? So I think that's one way and, and an example. Yanni, how about uh, uh, CVS? Um, some of the things that we've been able to leverage is job coaches. Uh, so sometimes individuals have um, a little bit of a harder time catching on to something or they need a little bit more time or um, just need a different resource. And so we've been leveraging job coaches that can come out and work being, with the person to teach them how to do the job or perform the job or do the task. Um, but sometimes it's not even about a job coach. Sometimes it's something as easy as a magnifying glass um, or, you know, something that can go over their computer screen so they can see the screen a little bit better. Um, and, and sometimes it's about, you know, getting uh, an interpreter to come into a meeting or to, you know, a one-on-one -on -one and be able to talk about some of the difficulties that they're having and identify why it is that someone isn't catching on to something or where somebody wants to go with their career and be able to do those IDPs with them. So um, we've been able to leverage all those things from our partners. Um, they've been great. Now I do want to go back and, and address the question that you did have about uh, job fairs, if I could real quick. Um, I do have a suggestion. I think that one of the things about job fairs is that they tend to be a marketing event more for employers than anything else. We do get to talk to a lot of candidates, but when you sit down to see who actually applied for the jobs, um, not always do you see the people that you talk to at those events apply for the jobs. Um, so you spend hours at, a, at an event and might get you know, a very small portion of those individuals applying. Uh, a suggestion that I would say is having people you know, um, apply before going into the jobs or into the job fairs. Um, so then we can talk to them about their resumes or talk to them about their application process. Okay. Dominique, would you like to share a success story from Southwest Airlines about a specific employee or uh, related to uh, their retention and even promotion? With I'm sorry. Dominique, would you like to share a specific su success story from Southwest Airlines uh, about uh, an employee uh, who is advanced uh, or been able to be retained uh, through uh, the efforts of uh, your program? Sure. I'm not sure if I have a specific um, story, but I, I think just when it comes to retaining and promoting um, our people with disabilities, um, we really focus kind of on that individualization and just approaching everything kind of on a case by case basis. What works for one person might not work for another. Um, I know in our call center, we have what we call VIPs where our customer reps um, are visually impaired and we provide them with all the tools and support from a people perspective and a technology perspective that they need to be able to, to help our customers over the phone. Um, and really just our leaders, I feel like they do a great job of um, taking the time out to, to meet individually with our employees. We have a very strength based approach um, to our performance um, evaluation and just um, really looking at, you know, what they're wanting to do with their career, focusing on those strengths, being able to, to, to work towards um, their end goal as far as their career goes. Um, but yeah, just, I think Southwest, we just really value that, that diversity and those differences and Overall, we just want to be able to, to kind of reflect the customers that we serve and the communities that we serve. So if we're able to have um, those folks staying on with us, we're able to, to accomplish that. Thank you, Dominique. I'd, I'd like to turn to the wisdom of the audience and check in with uh, Randy Turner. Do we have any questions uh, in Zoom from our uh, virtual audience? I need to steal the mic from Pat and Denny. All right. <laughs> so that everyone can hear. 
So oh, I'll take this one. All right, you guys can share. All right. Are there employees getting the word? Are there employers getting the word out to hire applicants with disabilities to the recruiters? So within your systems, essentially, as recruiters continually, continually get employers into trouble by failing to consider diversity inclusion in their practices. So are your employers getting to your recruiters? So our frontline managers working in right. tandem with recruiters to uh, recruit a diverse applicant pool. Is that the right. essence of the question? Right, stay in the microphone, Ron. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm moving around. I should have worn the lavalier one. So the, the question is, are your frontline hiring managers working hand in glove with uh, your recruiters to make sure that they're tapping into the sources of diverse applicant pools? And it sounds like Dell has a pretty good strategy of uh, meeting people where they're at. Um, anybody want to take that question? Yeah, I think there's always work to be done uh, when we talk about HR recruiting, and especially in a large healthcare system, uh, which, you know, some of our practices have become nationalized. We used to have the local HR person that sat a couple doors down from us in the office and with the paper applications. And the reality is that doesn't happen. It's a, you know, very a much more technical process than that. I will say what's worked for us, and this is not only with people with disabilities, but I'll say in general, is when we look at um, you know, putting in places where our managers are advocating with their, their recruiter, their talent acquisition partner, um, because they've had experience with somebody either to, through an internship or through an apprenticeship, through something like that. And that's really the beauty, I think, of, again, really require or attracting talent that we really need. Um, but in terms of you know, going back to the job fair and maybe the disconnect sometimes that we might have between a recruiter and that hiring manager, there certainly, I think, is always going to be work to, you know, work to be done there. Yeah. Dominique or Yanni, either one of you want to take that question? Yeah, I can jump in. Um, I know when our, our recruiters meet with our hiring managers, once those roles do become available, um, diversity is always a topic of discussion um, during kind of those intake meetings. Um, we have set some goals, um, not only for our candidate um, slates that we're presenting to our hiring leaders and making sure those are diverse, but also um, having that diversity on our interview panels. Um, and then we've also um, created some new diversity training um, that includes some disability etiquette awareness training, um, as well as just recognizing biases um, that we require all of our hiring leaders to take before they're able, even able to interview um, a candidate for a role. So we've put some things in place um, to make sure at least the awareness piece is there and that it's really on our recruiters to, to kind of follow through throughout that process to make sure that um, we are getting those, those diverse um, candidates um, um, in front of the hiring leaders. Glad to hear you're looking at the biases in the process. Uh, as a, a hiring manager with a vision impairment, I understand that uh, other disabilities making eye contact in the interview for somebody uh, with autism may not be uh, a neurotypical behavior, but this may be the best applicant that you can hire to solve your business problems. And so uh, making sure that we're bias-free in, in our processes is uh, a, a great evolution. Either of you want to? Yeah, I was going to say, so at Dell, we do have a program manager for the program that plays a pretty critical role. She's incredible, by the way, um, Danielle. And she plays this role between the uh, hiring managers and the talent acquisition team so that there's clarity around, you know, the type of role, the type of talent that we're looking uh, for in terms of skills and so forth, and then uh, helps conduct training for the managers as well as for the talent acquisition team, uh, similar to what, what we heard from Southwest on, on that. So it's been very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Melinda, I want to check back with you to offer an opportunity for anybody in the room that would like to ask a question of our panel, and then also see how we're doing on time. Don't see any hands up, but we do have one more question online, Randy will read. It's a really good one too, I think. What are you, all of you businesses doing to prevent recruiters and hiring managers from looking 
applicants up on social media to identify race, age, disability status, et cetera. This is a major problem of hidden discrimination that cannot be litigated where there is no evidence. Now you, you have told us LinkedIn is where people can put their best foot forward. Uh, obviously social media can also be where uh, Texas job seekers don't always put their best foot forward. Uh, and certainly as vocational rehabilitation professionals and job coaches, we always encourage our, our customers to clean up their social media history. But uh, what do you all think about that, that question? What are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I, I I'm certainly not an expert in that, but uh, you know, similar to what you you said earlier, which is you know, at early ages, individuals need to be coached about what is out on social media because honestly, I don't know how you can control what the, the risk is that that you described in terms of you know people searching you know what what's out there. So it's it is a risk for anyone um, based on just the power of social media. Right, I think that's it, Ron. All right, uh, we're pretty close to time. Do yes. we? Uh, so I'd like to uh, just take this moment to thank all of our panelists for the excellent work you're doing uh, and creating inclusive workplaces, uh, but also for serving as a role model for the other employers that are uh, participating in this event today. So please join me and give them all a hand. All right, next up, I'd like to call back uh, members of the Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities to present our nonprofit employer. Uh, no, I, I'm sorry, that would be the Martha Arbuckle Award. Oh, nonprofit, okay, I had it right the first time, the Nonprofit Award. MFA and I had to unwrap from all our layers of extra clothing we had on. For those in the room, it's like 64 degrees in here. So um, we about sat back down when um, Ron changed what we were doing. But we are presenting the Nonprofit Organization Award. And this award is going to Endeavors Unlimited. Endeavors Unlimited uh, provides housing, life skills training, and supportive employment opportunities for adults with disabilities. They provide both commercial services for businesses and government entities and employment opportunities for individuals with disabilities. Uh, Endeavors Unlimited believes that everyone deserves a chance to obtain and maintain gainful employment in a position that fits their skills and abilities. Approximately 75% of the employees have disabilities and Endeavors encourages all employees to grow and develop. They promote advancement through providing accessible training and learning opportunities at all levels. They've been recognized by the National Organization on Disability as a leading disability employer in 2020 and 2021, 2021 due to the organization's focus and policies towards individuals with disabilities. And they have asked Emma Faye Rudkin to accept on their behalf. And so she's gonna provide remarks from them. I'm from San Antonio, Texas myself. And so they wrote a little text message to me. They said, thank you to the Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities for the Lex Freedom Employment Awards. Very, very grateful to be honored on behalf of all their clients and the programs that they serve. And they look forward to serving. This nonprofit is focused on saving the vulnerable people in crisis. They love their jobs. They made sure they emphasized that. They love the work that they do, and it comes down to having the heart for the mission. And they know that everyone in this room understands what that fight to have a heart for the mission and the people that you serve. And so they're very, very grateful for this honor and for um, everyone in this room. So thank you so much for honoring them and their work and people with crisis that are vulnerable. So thank you guys.
And now we have the Martha Arbuckle Award winners. Hello again. The Martha Arbuckle Award recognizes the most innovative local committee project and is presented in memory of Austin's longtime disability advocate, Martha Arbuckle. The project does not necessarily have to be from a formal mayor's committee, but from any committee, organization, or collective that works together on an innovative project that helps raise awareness of disability issues or that promotes inclusion in the community. This year's Martha Arbuckle Award goes to the Paralyzed Veterans of America, PVA, Texas chapter. In 2017, the Texas chapter PVA recognized that there was a shortage of uh, accessible parking places for people with disabilities. And this was due to overuse of um, eligible disabled veterans who actually um, had the license plate. Um, and these individuals did not all have a mobility disability. So working with the Texas legislature over the past four years, following many sessions, providing testimony and educating the legislature on this issue, Senate Bill 792, 87th legislature was signed into law by Governor Abbott and will become effective January 1st, 2022. This law will ensure better availability of accessible parking uh, across the state for anyone with a mobility disability and valid, valid uh, parking placard and accessible tag. This year's award is being received by Ann Robinson. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and members of the Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities. I'm honored to be here today to accept this award presented to the Texas chapter of the Paralyzed Veterans of America. Over the past four years, Ann Robinson and Senator Donna Campbell and staff have worked diligently through several Texas sessions to achieve successful passing of Senate Bill 792. This bill updates handicap parking to require everyone to display the universal symbol of the wheelchair to legally park in, park in marked spaces. Thanks to the teamwork of the Texas chapter, Texas PBA members and Senator Campbell's team, the law passed the House and Senate without objection and was signed into law on May 24, 2021 by Duck Governor Greg Abbott. The new law allows access to all Texans in need of accessible parking. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And this beautiful award will be forwarded to the recipients. And thank you all. Thank you. The last of the Governor's Committee um, Lex Freed Employment Awards to be awarded today is the Governor's Trophy. <laughs> it is the Governor's Committee's highest honor and is awarded to the person who has achieved the highest success in enhancing the empowerment and employment of Texans with disabilities. The Governor's Trophy recognizes long-term commitment and outstanding efforts at both the community and state level as a professional or volunteer in the field of disability issues. Today, we bestow this award, this year's Governor's Trophy to Ms. Christy Avalos, CEO of Accessology, a national leader in accessible consulting services. Ms. Avalos is a longtime advocate for people with disabilities. Beginning her journey in 1977, when she worked as a convalesc at a convalescent home for children, 
She was later hired by American Airlines to implement the Air Carriers Access Act, and in 1990, created Accessology to provide training and consulting services on ADA compliance to architects, contractors, designers, building owners, universities, government agencies, municipalities, commercial lenders, attorneys, and others throughout Texas and the nation. For more than 30 years, Ms. Avalos has provided on-site direction and expert technical support to bring state and local governments into compliance through their legally mandated transition plans. Her entire adult life is dedicated to removing barriers for people with disabilities and bridging the gap between what people with disabilities need and what businesses or agencies provide. As a consultant for many large projects around the country, Ms. Avalos insists upon developing advisory boards made up of individuals with disabilities, giving each group a voice within their own community. Please join me in congratulating Ms. Christy Avalos, this year's Governor's Trophy winner. Good morning. Thank you so very much for this great honor. Um, I so wanted to be in Austin to personally accept this award. And I'm very sorry that life's challenges got in the way of my being there, but I'm no less appreciative and no less humbled by this great honor. I mean, how many people are fortunate enough to, to live their life's passion and then get an award for it? It doesn't even feel right. Although I'm not personally disabled, as was noted in the, um, in the introduction, I started working with disability issues in 1977. And um, every day I got to interact with these beautiful children, imaginative, funny, amazing children who had the same hopes and dreams and goals and aspirations of any other child I'd ever met. And there was a simple message to me, and that's that people are people, nothing else matters. Not age, not race, not religion, not economic status, um, and, and certainly not abilities. What matters is a person's heart. People need to focus on what they can do and not what they can't do, and so do employers. It's the heart that causes us to wanna learn what we learn in life. Uh, it, it, it's the heart that decides the path that we want to take and, and, and what challenges we want to um, fight. It's the heart that experiences the, um, the framework or, or that causes the framework of who we become as adults. And it's the heart that builds our passions and enriches our life. So having the heart for success was not enough for these kids because they were institutionalized in 1977. There was no one to take care of them during the day. Daycare centers wouldn't accept them. And so their parents had little choice but to put them in an institution at least Monday through Friday where they didn't have the opportunity to develop their own passions, their own desires. And there was just something about that that felt like it needed to be changed. So that sparked my passion. That sparked uh, what I hope every one of you in, in that room and every one of you that is watching feels every day when you go to work. And that's the opportunity to work, not just to get a paycheck, but to make it a place to utilize your heart, your passions, your skills, your talents. And that's what drives me because I believe everybody should work from their passion. And therefore, Accessology was built to derive that for, um, for other people. As we learned from COVID, people can work from their home. Um, if transportation is an issue uh, or was an issue, it shouldn't be an issue any longer. The world is ready. The world has recognized it. There weren't those options back in 1977. There were a lot of necessary steps uh, in order for everybody to be able to work and more importantly, work from their passions. And that required removing both attitudinal and architectural barriers. I worked for American Airlines for about 12 years and I really thought that taking on the airline industry was the way to go. 
I really thought that implementing the Air Carrier Access Act was going to really become um, a, a, an open door for people to move up in their careers. Because of course, if you could fly, then you have more job opportunities. But it was too soon for that. Access to air travel was great, but if people couldn't get hired into a building or if they couldn't afford the technology or if they couldn't find accessible housing, then, then it was really premature to think that air travel would make a difference in employment opportunities. And so in 1990, we started Accessology with a mission to bridge that gap between the disabled population and the, the business community. This award is not for me. It's for the many employees that have worked at Accessology over the past 30 plus years. Each one has their own talents and their own passions and their own, own goals and desires. And they've built our company to respond to the need. Each one is in their own way uh, making a difference with their own heart. It really does take a team. And we have some of the most dedicated employees. We have the honor to work with the agencies all across the country to develop their transition plans, to work with them, but most importantly, to work with their communities, to develop groups of people that have a voice in those communities. And if you, wherever you live, wherever you are in the country, if you would just get together with your local community, if you're on a, um, a college campus, it would be getting together with your disabled student services and the facilities groups. If you're in um, a small town, a large town, a big city, it doesn't matter. They need your voice. Because what I have found is that everybody wants to do the right thing. They don't know what the right thing is unless they hear from you. And building those committees, building those um, opportunities builds the voice nationwide. For those of you who would with disabilities who have been unable to find a job, I recommend you change your strategy or you at least look at your strategy and you show the potential employer who you are. Focus on what you're good at and why they should choose you. Don't focus on what you can't do. All of us can't do something, but we're all also really good at other things. And that's what we need to focus on. Recently, we've also become a non, be, <laughs> try it again. Recently, we've also begun a nonprofit organization called Learn Live Launch. And that's a place for people of all ages and all abilities to learn what their passions are, to develop those passions into a career and to launch into that career. We hope to partner with many of you employers out there to help make this happen. Across the country, we need employers that are looking to hire people with disabilities um, or to hire people who have gone through our program so that they learn how to be the best possible employee operating from their God-given passions. Everybody should have that opportunity to work uh, from their passions. You heard Tracy earlier talk about not being good at English, but being good at math. That's what we're talking about. Figure out what you're good at, move forward. So I thank you all for this great honor. I thank you for the work that each one of you have ha has done to make a difference. I promise the change is happening because of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christy, for those remarks and we'll be sure to get you this wonderful trophy and representing your work as well as the work of the Accessology team. We're nearing the end of our program and we're gonna end strong by in just a minute hearing from Dr. Lex Frieden. But first I'd like to take just a second to thank our higher ability partners at Texas Workforce Solutions. Specifically, I'd like to thank uh, Cheryl Fuller, Tammy Martin, Lisa Givens and Melinda Paninsky. You all make it really fun to promote the full employment of Texans with disabilities. And we're just so grateful for this fifth year of our partnership. Thank you very much for helping us put this event on today.
Once again, congratulations to all of our winners. I think you'll agree that the caliber, the quality of each of those uh, organizations and companies represented today are truly deserving of the name Lex Frieden Employment Award winner. And that's where we are today. We're now going to hear from Dr. Lex Frieden, who many know as the architect of the Americans with Disabilities Act who's a professor working in Houston at the Baylor College of Medicine. But for most of us, we just know him as our friend Lex. Uh, he's been such a tremendous mentor uh, and uh, such a, a positive source of energy in the disability community. And uh, I'm just so grateful that the Governor's Committee would name this important awards program in honor of Dr. Lex Frieden. So with that, I'm gonna turn to Randy Turner to open uh, Lex Frieden's microphone and let's hear closing remarks from Lex Frieden. Ron, thank you very much, and uh, thank all of you for being here uh, in the audience. Thank those of you who are there face-to-face uh, -face in, in Austin, and we all wish we could be with you, but uh, next year, perhaps, it will happen. Um, I want to particularly acknowledge the Governor's Committee on Persons with Disabilities. Thank all of you for your service. Uh, with, without volunteers like you, people who are willing to take time throughout the year to take part in the work of the committee. Uh, we would not be here today. We would not have the opportunity to acknowledge all of these uh, wonderful uh, models in, in our workforce, in our community. And uh, we would not have the opportunity to promote as we do employment of people with disabilities. I also want to recognize the Governor's Committee staff who works tirelessly, uh, not only to put on this program, but to carry out a full year, a full year's uh, uh, worth of effort every day promoting employment opportunities for people with disabilities. And finally, to those of you who have been awarded uh, a uh, recognition during this program, uh, congratulations to you. Obviously, you have achieved the recognition, uh, not because you've been seeking it, but because you've been doing the right thing. And uh, the Governor's Committee has uh, been able to provide you with some platform here to talk about the things that you have achieved. And I think it's important for everyone to hear that. I've had the pleasure of hearing much of the discussion this morning. And uh, I want to applaud those employers uh, who have come forward to share some of their best practices. And I trust that others will benefit from hearing the discussion. You know, the last year we've been challenged uh, with COVID and, uh, and many people with disabilities have been challenged. People who before did not acknowledge their disabilities have discovered, in fact, that this isolationism caused by uh, the COVID restrictions has exacerbated different types of disabilities. And, uh, and we have tried to cope with them and learned to, to uh, take on the challenge. I'm particularly concerned about kids in schools uh, who've not been properly served during the pandemic and, and particularly kids with disabilities. But that's changing. Uh, we are recovering. Our uh, employment base is recovering. And now we need to look at the opportunities. New opportunities have been created uh, as a result of COVID. For decades, literally decades, employers have said that remote work is not a good thing that people with disabilities who want to be employed need to be prepared to go to the workplace every day, that we need to have personal care assistants who can, on a timely and reliable basis, have us ready to meet transportation that we may or may not have access to. And we must appear in the workplace on a timely basis each day. That's been a horrible challenge for many people with disabilities who are extraordinarily well qualified to work and could be working using the remote technology that we have. 
And in the past year, employers have learned because they've needed to depend on that technology to get the jobs done, that people working in a remote environment can be just as productive, if not more so, than people in a face-to-face -face office setting uh, where they spend many hours during the week transporting back and forth to work. Those hours are now spent in the workplace on the job and people are getting more things done and people with disabilities are included in a way they have never been before. And we have more opportunities now than ever before. And that I think is the challenge of the new norm. Uh, people with disabilities need to put themselves in the position of being hired. Uh, three out of four Texans with disabilities who are looking for work don't have a job right now, and all of those people are very well qualified. Many employers know that. Others need to learn that. And I charge those of you who have been recognized here today and those members of the governor's committee who are with us, uh, go forth and teach the employers in Texas who have yet to learn the benefits of hiring people with disabilities to do so. Uh, those of us who are people with disabilities need to be prepared to take advantage of those opportunities. And we all need to work together to ensure a better life in Texas for people with disabilities. Thank you all for being here and being a part of the program today. Thank you so much, Dr. Frieden. Thank you to all of our presenters. Congratulations to all of our award recipients. And thank you very much to our audience, both here in Austin and virtually. We have so appreciated that you joined us today. We look forward to seeing you again next year. And with that, everybody have a great day. Thank you.